uh, just he's entering the office. So just in five minutes, we'll start the program. Yes, Shalom, Shaib, uh, Chief Guest of today's program. Uh, with your permission, sir, can we start? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, welcome, everyone. I would like to begin today's program by paying our respects to the father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and all members of his family and many others who were martyred on the night of August 15, 1975. Chief Guest, Mr. Sharir Alam MP, Honorable State Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Government of People's Republic of Bangladesh. Special guests, His Excellency, Mr. Robert Chatterton Dixon, British High Commissioner to Bangladesh. Her Excellency, Ms. Saida Munatasneem, High Commissioner of Bangladesh to the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Liberia. Today's keynote speaker, Dr. Salim Raihan, Executive Director, South Asian Network on Economic Modeling, SANEM. Distinguished panel discussants and business leaders, my respected colleagues from GCCI, friends from print and electric media, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to the webinar titled Exploring Trade and FDA Opportunities with the UK, organized by Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I would like to express my gratitude to the chief guest along with the special guests to find the time despite their busy schedules to join today's webinar. Also, I would like to extend a special thank you to Her Excellency Sadia Tasnim Muna for joining us today, despite it being really early in the morning in the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh has a long standing friendly ties with the United Kingdom. The UK was the first European country to recognize Bangladesh. Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman laid the foundation of this relationship when he made a stopover in London on his way back to Bangladesh after being released from Pakistan in 1972. Distinguished guests, DCCI, the pri largest private sector representative body in Bangladesh with over 4,000 members from SMEs to large businesses has always been a part of development journey of the country. Since 1958, DCCI has been playing many important roles in wide ranging macroeconomic avenues from nation's future prospects, cross-border trade, industrial investment, business ecosystem development, and the country's competitiveness and bilateral economic cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, despite COVID-19 stress across the global economy, Bangladesh has registered a remarkable 5.24% GDP growth in financial year 2019-2020, backed by strong economic fundamental and resilience withstanding the economic shock. By overcoming COVID-19 economic fallout, Bangladesh economy is expected to rebound in 2021, propelled by a V-shaped recovery with 8% plus GDP growth. Bangladesh, the natural gateway between ASEAN and South Asia has emerged as one of Asia's most re remarkable success stories with commendable progress on socioeconomic fronts. Prior to the pandemic time, the economy of Bangladesh grew by a record 8.15% in financial year 2018-19 and was marked as one of the fastest growing economies in Asia Pacific. Putting on this solid growth and consistent economic performance, Bangladesh met all UN criteria to graduate into a developing country by 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, the ability of Bangladesh to offer goods and services at a competitive price, strong remittance inflow, consistent growth in the national market and private investment, low external borrowing, robust foreign currency reserve, and business-friendly environment has positioned Bangladesh as an emerging regional economic powerhouse. In the wake of rapid economic growth and economic prospects, global credit rating agencies, S&P and Moody's maintain their longstanding ratings of PB- and BA3, respectively, affirming a stable outlook for Bangladesh's growth potential. The UK-based global economic consultancy firm Center for Economic and Business Research forecasted Bangladesh to become the world's 26th largest economy by 2029, outshining Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, the fully operational nine export processing zones, planned 100 economic zones, online one-stop service 
for investors and tax holiday for 33 sectors and competitive fiscal and non-fiscal in investment incentives are branding Bangladesh as a favorite investment hub. Bangladesh has already improved much of the business conditions to attract foreign investments and in the process of, is in the process of easing investors' concerns to improve the country's competitiveness in trade and investment. Reform initiatives of the government for pro-business environment has helped Bangladesh to position in the list of top 20 improving countries in the World Bank doing business report 2020. Bangladesh Bank has implemented a reform measure to attract foreign investment by easing the process for repatriation, the sales proceed of non-residents equity investment in non-listed public limited companies and private limited companies. Moreover, reform initiative has been taken to update Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. These measures helped increase confidence of foreign investors manifold. Also, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh, as per division of her Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, has put economic diplomacy in the forefront. Ladies and gentlemen, the UK is a large trade and investment partner of Bangladesh. Export of Bangladesh to the UK was USD 3.45 billion in financial year 2019-20, whereas it was USD 4.83 billion in financial year 2018-19, recording a 28.57% negative growth. The UK is also the second biggest foreign investor in Bangladesh, registering accumulated FDI stock, USD 2.45 billion as of March 2020, with more than 200 British companies operating in Bangladesh in retail, banking, energy, infrastructure, consultancy, and education sectors, to mention a few. Ladies and gentlemen, Enhancing trade and investment relation between the UK and Bangladesh today with the current global economic outlook and especially post brexit relationship between the two countries in international trade has emerged as an important agenda for the business community. In this transitional period, we expect that investment from the UK into the Bangladesh will continue and also reach new heights with closer cooperation and relationship. Moreover, besides the traditional sectors like RMG textiles, leather and footwear, agro products, pharmaceuticals, Investment collaboration or joint ventures can be extended into emerging areas such as clean technologies, renewable energy, industrial research, 4IR, backed innovation and technologies, automobile assembly, etc. In this support, high commissions of both the countries can play an important role to increase trade and investment with Bangladesh by showcasing the opportunities and potentials of Bangladesh, British investors, and holding B2B dialogues to avail the investment and trade opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to focus on designing innovative model to attract investment from UK, apart from ex existing equity investments, mergers and acquisition arrangements. Listing Bangla bond in the London Stock Exchange in 2019 unlocked new investment avenue. Bangladeshi corporate houses with credible international credit ratings may replicate the success story of Bangla bond by introducing more Taka and pound sterling denominated bonds in the London Stock Exchange for financing industrial projects Moreover, the government can introduce infrastructure bonds in Bangladesh to attract investment from UK for developing large infrastructure projects. Ladies and gentlemen, the UK is an important trading partner of Bangladesh. The UK's export market is crucial to sustain our development journey. Due to COVID-19, our export trade has been affected so far. Post-Brexit, the Bangladesh business community would want to see continuation of duty-free, quota-free access to the UK along with the retention of the existing GSP facilities for Bangladesh. DCCI feels that it has become very important for both Bangladesh and the UK to have a free trade agreement in place and to take economic and to take the economic relationship between the business communities of both the countries to near heights and set new milestones. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope the keynote presentation today and the export opinions of this webinar will provide more insights for exploring trade and investment opportunities with the UK. I believe our honorable chief guest and the special guests will also enlighten us with any necessary directions on this important agenda. Before I finish, I would like to thank you all once again uh, for joining today's webinar. Thank you, all of us. Um, with this, I would like to request uh, Dr. Raihan if uh, you can uh, uh, start the presentation for today's webinar. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Mahmoud, and uh, uh, good morning to you all. Uh, uh, Honorable Minister, distinguished panelists, and distinguished guests and participants, uh, it's my privilege to present uh, something in front of you. Uh, I'm in the next uh, few minutes, 20 minutes, I'm going to present uh, uh, the kind of keynote presentation on this investment and trade opportunities of Bangladesh with the United Kingdom. So I hope that I'll be able to actually shed light on some of the very important issues. Uh, at the same time, I will, uh, this presentation will trigger uh, some of the very important, aspect, important aspects of this whole issue. So let me go through this presentation. So if we look at the, uh, look at the trend of Bangladesh export to the UK, and uh, here I have actually provided data for the last two decades, and you can see that actually it's growing. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm keeping aside that COVID uh, uh, phenomena, and as Mr. Mahmoud rightly pointed out, in the last uh, financial year, actually, we had a drop in export. Uh, but uh, we are expecting that we'll get out of this situation and we'll get back to this trend. So now it is around, uh, the latest figure shows around uh, $4 billion of uh, export, Bangladesh export to the UK. And uh, if we look at the share of Bangladesh export to the UK in total export of Bangladesh, it is actually declined uh, because Bangladesh also uh, uh, exported in other countries and also the kind of the Bangladesh export destination, especially uh, in the European, other European countries as well as in other countries. So it's a, there is a kind of diversification. Uh, but uh, if we look at uh, still, it is around 8.5% and UK is the third largest export destination of Bangladesh, according to the recent data. Now, if we look at the share of Bangladesh export to the UK in, in UK's import from the world, that means what is the contribution of importing from Bangladesh in UK in total UK's import? And you can see that it is actually around 0.6%. It has remained kind of stable over the last few years. So if we look at the composition of Bangladesh export to the UK, in, and this is the figure of the latest figure of 2018, and you can see that it's heavily, heavily concentrated on ready-made garments. Uh, though there are also uh, other products, but still, if you uh, take this to account, uh, 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 take into account this uh, uh, woven and knitwear, and you can see that they are uh, around close to 90% or more than that. Uh, so around 93%. That means that still there are scopes for diversification of exports while uh, exporting to the UK. So, and this is the kind of trend. In the last slide, I provided you kind of a snapshot of the recent, da uh, recent uh, data, but uh, recent year. But you can see that if I put this whole data from 1996 to 2018, uh, the textile or garments is dominates. That means that still, well, despite that, Bangladesh was given the duty free market access in European Union and UK was part of that. Uh, it is the ready-made garments which dominated, and then other there are scopes for other sectors to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, get into UK's market and flourish the export. Now, if we look at Bangladesh's import from the UK, so and uh, in recent years it's growing, but uh, despite that, it is below 0 0.5 billion dollar. So that means that there are still scopes for actually even importing from UK. And the recent trend is encouraging that Bangladesh is importing from UK. And if we look at the share of Bangladesh import from UK in total import of Bangladesh, that means that how much Bangladesh is actually importing from UK out of this total import. And is in recent years, it is increasing. And you can see it's around, now the recent data shows it is around 1% of total import of Bangladesh, uh, the importing from UK accounts for. So, and now if we look at the share of UK's export to Bangladesh in UK's total export to the world, that means how much UK is exporting to Bangladesh and how much does it constitute or it, it take into account, uh, it accounts for UK's total uh, export, uh, the share. And you can see that is around 0.1%. So it's, it's not that UK, Bangladesh is not a major export destination as we can understand from uh, the data, uh, data still uh, for UK, but uh, definitely for FDI and, uh, uh, and even exporting, uh, importing from Bangladesh, the trading, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the, these are the major areas where I think the future lies with the trade and FDI opportunities. Now, what did Bangladesh import from UK? And this is the very snapshot of 2018. 
and you can see that it's mostly the industrial raw materials, the composition, and you can see. And if I put a trend from 1996-2018, you can see it's mostly the industrial raw materials and machineries, metals and machinery. So that means that uh, whatever Bangladesh imports from UK is actually helping Bangladesh's industrialization process. Now, this is an analysis I actually put forward and I did it a very data intensive analysis where I, I'll, I'll take a minute or so to explain to you what is that. So here I really wanted to show that Bangladesh has still some very important export capacity while we are talking about exporting to UK, but much of this capacity is actually still uh, unrealized. So in the, uh, in the uh, uh, here, this excess, horizontal excess, so I put export capacity. By export capacity, I define the ratio of Bangladesh export to the world divided by UK import from the world. I give you one example. For, ex uh, for example, Bangladesh exports one particular product at HS code six digit level, $1 million uh, to the world. And UK also import the same uh, product uh, at the six digit level. One, uh, for example, UK imports $1 million. That means Bangladesh has the capacity to meet UK's total import demand of $1 million of that particular product. So here, this is called the export capacity where Bangladesh has this. So it, it is the range is zero to one. That means one means Bangladesh has the full capacity to meet the demand of the import of UK. And on the vertical axis, I have put the actual export. That means this is the ratio of Bangladesh export to the UK and to UK's import from the world. That means how much Bangladesh is exporting to UK in proportion to how much UK is importing from the world. So if you now on the 45 degree line, that means whatever the export capacity you have, you are actually meeting that, uh, you are actually exporting that amount. So if you're on the 45 degree, now you're seeing that there are a huge uh, kind of number of products, a bunch of products where Bangladesh has very high export capacity but actually the actual exports are low. So I can see that when our uh, exporters, they want to explore the uh, export potentials in the UK, they should look at these products. And I'll, I'll actually mention some of these products uh, now in the next slide. So here I have, what I have done in the last slide, actually it was, the exercise was at the six digit level. So I have now clubbed them together in, at the two digit HS code level. So here you can see that uh, two digit starts from here, 03 to 99 category. Uh, and I have actually, uh, you can see some peaks, spikes. That means these are the number of products at the six digit HS code. Uh, now when they are clubbed at the two digit code, where Bangladesh has high export capacity, but the actual exports are low. So I have actually circled them and you can see that they are centered around certain categories of products. For example, you can see that the first category is the products, mostly the primary products, and then you can see more the uh, fabrics, uh, leather, ready-made garments, and some light engineering. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, I'll mention some of these products very specifically. Now, if we look at the FDI from UK to Bangladesh, so it is also an increasing, uh, kind of we can see the increasing trend, but despite that, uh, uh, we, we are, despite that increasing trend, uh, the FDI amount is still very low. It is less than 400 million US dollar. And you can see that the number is uh, only 370 in 2018. And the share of UK's FDI in total FDI in Bangladesh, uh, it has some fluctuating trend. And recent years, we can see that it, it also declined, but still it is around 10% of total FDI in Bangladesh, UK accounts for. But here the point is that when we are talking about investment, foreign direct investment, is it the rate of return which really matters? Or so are the foreign investors, they are looking for a high rate of returns and they, then they go to this con those countries, the, the countries which offer high rate of returns. So actually my analysis and my understanding is that I'm, 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 I have the confidence that the uh, distinguished panelists, they will also agree with me that the potential investors are likely to consider the, of course, the rate of return before deciding to invest, invest abroad, which is the percentage gain or loss on an investment over a specific period. However, investment levels do not necessarily follow rates of return. Investors may value the perceived security of an economy and its currency above rate of return. So if an economy is stable and is seen as a safe place to invest, it may be more attractive to investors 
then some are perceived as riskier, albeit with higher expected return. So example is that other factors affecting investment decision include price levels, interest rates, and tax loss. For example, Ireland, the sixth largest destination for UK investment has one of the lowest rates of corporate tax in Europe, 12.5%. Uh, now I want to show you a very interesting graph. So these are the values of and rates of return on UK investment overseas, and these are the top 10 investment partners of UK. And here on the horizontal axis, I have put UK investment overseas, FDI, FDI is a billion pound. And on the vertical axis, I have put the rate of return. And we can see that there are uh, uh, certain countries where the, actually the rate of return is low, but UK's investment is very high. And US probably is a very, very extreme outlier here. But you can see a bunch of countries, even from European countries, you know, you can see that compared to Hong Kong and Australia, where you have a very high rate of return, you can actually have a very high FDI in, the, in, the, in, the, in those countries where you actually have low rate of return. So rate of return is, is not the only deciding factor. There are many other factors. And I, here, I think Bangladesh has to take into account these factors very seriously while attracting UK uh, FDI. Now, we want to see the composition of UK investment. So in which sectors does the UK invest? So I took the data of the stock of outward FDI from UK to the world in 2017. This is the latest data I had. Now you can see actually this is the tertiary sector, 63%. Tertiary sector means the service sector, which actually takes into account 63% uh, uh, of UK investment overseas. And manufacturing sector is not small, 17%. And you can see 11% are primary, and there are some unspecified sectors, 9%. And then I tried to, here, here you can see the tertiary sector, 63%. I tried to actually uh, unbundle the tertiary sector. Uh, and uh, there are certain, even not all the tertiary sectors receiving the same kind of proportion. There are some concentration of certain sectors within the certain subsectors within the tertiary sectors. And if I actually circle them, you can see within the tertiary sectors, uh, the information communication has got around 10% of UK investment overseas. And uh, the financial insurance, that is the largest, uh, you know, the, the sector with the largest uh, export, uh, FDI, UK FDI, mm -hmm. around 37%. So I can, you can see that the manufacturing around 18%, information telecommunication around 10%, and the financial and insurance around 37%. These are the three major FDI uh, uh, oriented sectors as, as far as UK's uh, versus FDI, outflow of FDI is concerned. Now, if we look at the composition of the stock of FDI in Bangladesh, and this is the latest data I want to show you. This is a stock, it's not a flow. So in 2018, the left-hand side graph, it shows the FDI from the world, and the right-hand side shows the FDI from the UK. You don't see much difference, the composition. The tertiary sector actually dominates the service sector. Uh, and then, but still, you know, probably uh, for the, in the case of UK, FDI from UK, you see a kind of higher percentage of the manufacturing sector compared to of average uh, you know, overall FDI from the world. Now, if we look at UK's FDI to Asia, and this is a trend you can see uh, from 2006 to 2018, and it's growing. Uh, and then uh, it, it has been growing. And then that means that there are prospects of larger FDI from UK to Asian countries in the coming years. But the question is whether Bangladesh will be able to attract that, 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 that you know, much of that FDI. Here is the answer, a bit of the answer. So UK's FDI to Asia in 2018, and which are the countries who received the largest chunk of it? And you can see Japan, of course, and then see many other countries. And Bangladesh received only 0 0.37 billion of US dollar. Uh, you can see Bangladesh in comparison to Pakistan. Pakistan received almost uh, close, to, uh, close to $4 billion of UK FDI, and Bangladesh 10% uh, of it. So. That means that Bangladesh is still very much lagging behind uh, in terms of attracting UK's FDI. And uh, in, if we take into account UK's FDI in Asia, Bangladesh received only 0.03% of UK's FDI in Asia uh, in 2018. Now I'm very much my, uh, to the, my last part of my presentation. So I, wanted to, I want to talk about what are the challenges of unleashing the trade and FDI opportunities of Bangladesh with the UK. Here I identify four issues. My first issue is that 
Bangladesh's high export concentration and challenge of export diversification, I treat it as a kind of very, very important constraint or, uh, or challenges, uh, challenge. And uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, and I've showed you earlier that we all agree that how concentrated Bangladesh export basket is, and there are huge challenges of export diversification. Now, what are the major challenges in export diversification? In my understanding, I have written quite a lot on this, that there are actually pro-ready-made garments bias in the policies and programs. I don't really want to elaborate here, but what I want to say in brief that the policies and programs of related to export, export sector, export diversification, whatever we have, even exchange rate policies, we see there is a kind of implicit and ex explicit bias towards the ready-made garments. Whereas the other sectors, if you take into account leather, uh, uh, footwear, of uh, ag agro processing and many other sectors, uh, we don't see kind of equal treatment when it comes to treating ready-made garments and other sectors on the on the kind of level playing field. My second point is that inadequate policies and strategies that hurt the non-ready-made garment sectors. And here I'd mention, of course, the our exchange rate policy, our kind of overvalued exchange rate policy, the real effective exchange rate, which actually is now highly overvalued, which is affecting more the non-ready-made garment sectors. There's a weak collective action of the non-ready-made garment sectors. The ready-made garment sector, they have a very strong lobby, but the other uh, sectors, they don't have much stronger lobby. And that's why they are not really able to get their uh, benefits, uh, you know, their due benefits out of, you know, through the negotiation process. An environment with a high cost of doing business that disproportionately affects the non-ready-made garments. So since I'm talking about the export diversification, I'm mentioning the non-ready-made garments more because even with this, high cost of doing business environment, the ready-made garments, they survived and they flourished. But it's more of the non-ready-made garment sectors which, which, they were, you know, which were affected disproportionately because of this high cost of doing business. And also I want to highlight the point that we have a poor public spending on health and education leading to low productivity and skill development. Unless and until you have a high productivity and a high skilled workforce, high productive and high skilled workforce, it will be extremely difficult to move to uh, you know, uh, other sectors, the high value added sectors. So I think this is extremely important while we talk about uh, export diversification. Now, the second point is about the Brexit and trade preference for Bangladesh. So it's now we are talking about the kind of post Brexit and what are the trade agreements? Uh, we need a trade agreement with the UK and Bangladesh and what are the Bangladesh export opportunities? As I showed you earlier, and from that analysis, the, uh, the kind of analysis at the strict zero HS code level, and then I club them into the two digit HS code level. So I see that Bangladesh has very important export opportunities in the UK in these sectors, frozen shrimp, fish, shrimp, animal products, vegetables, fruits and nuts, tea, chemicals and chemical products, plastic products, rubber, leather and leather goods, jute goods, synthetic fibers, towels, even a neat ready-made garments and other textile goods, and there are some light engineering. So I, you can see that these are all diversified products, and rather than considering only one category of products, which are the ready-made garments, Bangladesh must actually uh, find a ways out how the other sectors can solve their problems, and uh, the cost of doing business can be reduced, and then these sectors can also uh, be in a position to uh, increase the export to UK and other countries as well, uh, uh, you know, quite significantly. We need a trade agreement with the UK for the continuation of the zero duty trade preference for Bangladesh in the post-Brexit era. And of course, we need an FTA negotiation with the UK in the post-LDC graduation era. As Bangladesh will be graduated uh, from the LDC status, uh, we need to have an FTA agreement with the UK so that we uh, uh, kind of, we still enjoy the trade preference, what, uh, you know, duty free, duty free trade preference. So my third point is the LDC graduation of Bangladesh. And you can see that uh, still it's, it, it is coming as, uh, of course, there will be opportunities, but there are challenges. The challenges that involve the loss of trade preference in major export destinations, loss of other preferences, especially, for example, trips over for, over for pharmaceuticals, more stringent uh, trade rules as a non-LDC, because as an LDC, Bangladesh enjoys exemption from many trade rules. Uh, but when you become a non-LDC, uh, many trade rules, stringent trade rules from the WTO, which will be also applied for Bangladesh. And there are prospects of larger inflow of FDI because as we graduate out of the LDC status, we have a better country image, but this is not automatic. As I've showed you earlier that 
we need to actually do a very good homework and we need to solve our high cost of doing business and many other uh, improvement in many other, many other areas to attract uh, FDI. And my final point is that Bangladesh's low FDI orientation and challenge in attracting FDI. So if you look at this uh, table, uh, we can see that uh, this is the, some of the uh, Asian countries where I have put the FDI as percent of GDP and FDI inflow in billion US dollar. And I have put the average for 2014, 2018 just to avoid the fluctuation. And I just want to highlight two countries, Bangladesh and Vietnam. You can see that very the, the kind of striking difference. Uh, Bangladesh uh, and Vietnam, the, in terms of FDI as a percent of GDP, and also in terms of annual average inflow of FDI. So Bang Vietnam is almost six times or five times higher than Bangladesh. And uh, the uh, reason I'm mentioning Vietnam is that Vietnam is a major competitor of Bangladesh. Very recently, Vietnam superseded Bangladesh in terms of ready-made garments export and became the second largest export in the world. And Vietnam also is having uh, an FTA agreement with the European Union. So, you know, Bangladesh is going, to, uh, Vietnam is of course going to uh, now and also going to be a major competitor for Bangladesh in the future. So what are the challenges in attracting FTI? I've talked about the high cost of big business, unfavorable regulatory environment, bureaucratic red tape, uncertainty in reform of policy regime. There are important need for, or need for import reforms in important policy areas, but still we are kind of lagging behind. Uh, in reforming. For example, I, I've already talked about the exchange rate policy. There are, we need to have reforms in tax policies, in uh, trade policies, and many other, and financial sector, of course. Weak enforcement of intellectual property rights. I think this is extremely important. If we have very weak enforcement of IPR, intellectual property right, we can't attract large scale FDI. We need to work on this. I, th I know that we have very nice rules on the paper, but when it comes to enforcement, our enforcement is very weak. And then the slow implementation of the infrastructure projects, including the SEZs, we need to get some special economic zone, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, ready uh, as soon as possible to attract the FDI. So my very final slide, what are the way forward? I have already talked about the, you know, some of these things, but just to summarize. I didn't talk much about the COVID-19, but I am quite sure on uh, the distinguished panelists, uh, they will talk about it and uh, in the discussion it will come. But I think we need to have uh, necessary reform measures during COVID-19 and the post-COVID-19 eras. We, ne we need to initiate a dialogue for free trade and investment agreements with the UK. We need to undertake reform in critical economic domains. I have already mentioned about those domains. Undertake reforms to reduce cost of business simplify regulations and enforcement of the IPR, faster and cost-effective implementation of the mega projects and the special economic zones. And of course, for very finally, high public spending on the skill development, especially uh, with respect to health and education and human capital. I'll stop here and many thanks for your very kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salim Ryan, uh, Professor, Department of Economics. Uh, and e Executive Director of Sanem for this wonderful presentation. Uh, you've covered the whole gamut, I would say, and uh, it leaves a lot of food for thought. And we need, we need to, uh, I hope like today with the discussion we will have with our distinguished panelists, we will find a way forward. Some ideas will come up, uh, but then again, we need uh, uh, the Honorable Chief Guest is here. So we would like to bring forth all the problems uh, that you've addressed and how we should tackle them. Thank you. I would request uh, Mr. Asan Khan Chaudhary, uh, Chairman and CEO of Pran Honorable Group. Um, Sanibai, I know you're busy, uh, so I came to you first. Uh, and also, like, uh, it's very interesting that Pran uh, was one of the first companies out of Bangladesh to take advantage of the financial scope, the opportunity there was of launching the bond. So. I would like you to touch upon on that, like how the process was and uh, uh, whether other businesses in Bangladesh can follow the same um, path uh, of raising funds from the UK. And also uh, your business is engaged in um, uh, uh, you know, plastic goods, uh, FMCG products. So the scope of that for the UK market uh, down the line, uh, how do you see the potentials and how important do you think FTA with the UK will be uh, in the near future? Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Shams Bhai. Uh, thank you for Dhaka Chambers uh, to arrange this uh, this program timely. I think uh, most important thing is uh, we have to diversify our export uh, portfolio and we have to continue to uh, uh, develop our business. So I think uh, I'll start the first idea with my uh, diversification. Uh, I think uh, Pran as a company, we have been active uh, in the UK for many years. Our first journey into the UK was uh, with our food business. We were doing a lot of exports of food products to the ethnic uh, Bangladeshi market in the, in the UK. Uh, to the Bangladeshi diaspora that is there. But now we have graduated. You know, you'll be happy to know that we are in Tesco and we are in uh, uh, Sainsbury's and others uh, under uh, different private label brands. And we are exporting a lot of frozen products uh, from Bangladesh to, to the UK market. So UK is becoming a very important market. Uh, then we do a lot of uh, exports of plastic products. Uh, we do a lot of business into uh, outlets like Wilco. Um, we are we are trying to uh, do and more uh, more and more to the one pound stores. Uh, I think uh, our business uh, in the plastic area will be very important. Uh, last business that I will talk about is our bicycle business. Uh, you know, I, I would say that Bangladesh probably has the largest market share uh, into the UK market uh, for exporting uh, bicycles from Bangladesh to the UK market. And uh, as a company like RFL, we are exporting almost like 40,000 pieces of bicycle on a monthly basis. So a uh, huge opportunity uh, that UK has because of our traditional relationship, which goes back hundreds of years. Uh, I think that tradition continues. And uh, we as uh, manufacturers here in Bangladesh, we have been able to uh, diversify our uh, export portfolio uh, that we have today. And we are able to export more and more uh, into the UK market. So. A uh, few th challenging things are coming, uh, GSP uh, post Brexit era, uh, you know, so many challenges are there. So I think FTA is uh, something that Bangladesh has to learn to do. Uh, I think that those days are over where we should be very scared that we will not be competitive in the international market. We have to remain very competitive and we have to establish our bonds with our uh, great loyal markets like United Kingdom. So uh, there is a lot of opportunity. I really uh, saw a one full paper that has been produced, uh, a great thought, great uh, paperwork. Uh, so thanks to you, but I don't want to elaborate on the number work, but I want to tell you that FTA will something that Bangladesh has to move on. And we have to sign the FTAs with, with countries which have got strategic importance for us. And UK happens to be a very, very important uh, uh, market for that. Uh, you asked me about the bond. Uh, I think uh, it's a wonderful uh, question that you asked, Shamsbhai, because that is how you know, corporates in Bangladesh have to think. You know, like say, I would say that uh, Bangladeshi corporates will become very, very large. And we have to think beyond the borders of Bangladesh. And uh, the way when you require that in the international market, you have to think about uh, bonds. Uh, and, uh, you know, and thinking about bonds, you cannot depend only on bank borrowing. You have to think about uh, BDT denominated bonds and you have to think about uh, international currency denominated bonds. So. I would say that Pran was a company which, with the help of IFC, we did a uh, bond offering into the UK, and Munapa is also here. Her Excellency is here, so I'm very happy to see and appreciated all her support that we received uh, from her when we were in the UK. And uh, we were successful uh, issuing a BDT denominated bonds. I feel this is just the beginning for Bangladeshi corporates to go to the international market to issue bonds, uh, which can be a better market uh, than the UK, where it is probably the financial center of the world. So we should take advantage and we should build up on our historic ties that goes beyond uh, many, many years. So we feel that we should do more in the international market, uh, you know, and uh, Bangladeshi corporates should start issuing bonds so that Bangladeshi corporates can uh, really fulfill this requirement that we have on the FDI. Uh, FDI, you know, like say, we can wait for the foreign people to come into Bangladesh for with their FDI. Or Bangladeshi people are extremely entrepreneurial. And I feel that even if uh, international FDI is a bit slow, we can tap into the bond route. We can get international bond coming into our beautiful market and take advantage of our market, take advantage of our cost competitiveness, create a lot of employment here in Bangladesh and take advantage of the export market which waits for Bangladesh. And I would say that uh, today we are 40 billion in export. Uh, there'll be a time when we'll be sitting with Dhaka Chamber and discussing about our $400 billion of export uh, celebration that we'll be having. And I think that FTA would be the discussion going forward for Bangladeshi exporters to go into the inter international market so that 
we establish more FTAs and take our country forward. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you guys and share my thoughts and uh, good luck to all the exporters in Bangladesh and uh, good luck for uh, British-Bangladesh relationships so that we are able to take things forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much, Tanibe. Uh, and uh, uh, it is always refreshing to hear from you. You're very positive and optimistic, and it gives us a reason to smile from the private sector. And uh, you have, uh, and as as you have mentioned, we have seen the Quran thinks out of the box, and it is time that we also think out of the box, because we cannot expect the government to do everything for the private sector. The private sector also needs to take initiative. And if it's a positive thing, if it's a, if it brings success, then the government will obviously, as it is a pro-friend, a business-friendly government at the moment we have in Bangladesh, uh, they will take policy uh, steps to facilitate uh, these. Uh, thank you once again, Sanibai. At this moment, I would like to uh, welcome Ms. Uh, Sharifa Khan, Additional Secretary, FTA Wing, Ministry of Commerce, Government of Bangladesh. Uh, the key person, the uh, the main topic of discussion today will be the free trade agreement with the UK, between Bangladesh and the UK. And she is the person who, who will make it happen if it does happen. So we are really uh, eager to hear from you, Mr. Ripa Khan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, uh, it is my pleasure to attend this very uh, nice uh, seminar uh, for four distinct panelists, uh, Honorable uh, State Minister, Her Excellency Munat Tasnim, uh, Excellency Robert Dixon, distinguished panelists and uh, participants. Uh, 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 first of all, I'd like to express my thanks to Selim Rayhan for the very, very nice presentation and very thought-provoking presentation. I, I, I wrote many of the things to be the panelist, but uh, I found that most of the issues are covered by you. So I do not like to go on those issues for the avoiding the repetition. Uh, but uh, let's start with the FTA issue. Uh, if FTA, uh, I like the more important issues. One is FTA to get gain from the uh, uh, tariff uh, regime because uh, if you are compete, if you can get access at a lower uh, tariff compared to your competitor, then it is worthwhile to sign an FTA. But I like to inform uh, and our distinguished honourable excellency is here. He will also, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, also uh, 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 echoing voice with me. Just immediately after the Brexit election, one. One year after the Brexit election, UK government declared that they will continue the free free benefit for the LDCs as uh, they were as the EU did before. So, and after that, they reassured it on 10th of February 2020 through a letter to by the Robert Dixon to our Honorable Minister. So, we are assured that we will get the duty free market access in UK until 2027. So, in that case how far it is justified to co sign or initiate an FTA with the other, because FTA is not unilateral, it is um, uh, uh, take or, uh, so if we go for the FTA, we also have to remove duty for the UK side, but at present we are getting the unilateral benefits uh, uh, under the EU scheme and that EU, uh, EU British government or UK will also continue. So um, why is there any justification to initiate FTA with UK uh, before the uh, uh, termination of the uh, EBS duty free quota free market exchange? That is one of the point I like to highlight. Another thing is the UK government it has taken an initiative, policy initiatives, to reduce their duties across the globe. They, they, will, uh, they will remove all the nuisance duties. That, is, that means the duties which are currently below the 2.5%, that will come down to zero. And that in the slab below 20, which are the duties currently below 20, that will come down around 5%. And uh, the, uh, which is above 20%, that will come down to 10% like that. So. Actually, the tariff margin, tariff preference will go down because so that your overall, when the when the overall tariff structure will decline, it will also 
decline your price margin. So these are the two issues we need to think of before initiating the FTA negotiations. First, we are getting the duty-free benefit and that will continue until 2027. And another one is the government is uh, going to reduce the uh, tariff across the globe. So under that point, uh, how whether it will be worthwhile, that needs a study and I'll, I'll ask uh, him to uh, think in that direction. And I'll, I also like to thank uh, uh, Selim for one of the issues because we know this is the time we need to think of sector wise and country wise issues. Otherwise, we cannot, a general seminar, general uh, discussion will not actually help the exporters to go into the uh, penetrate into the particular market. In that case, I think Selim gives out the ideas which are the products we can uh, continue. In that case, I like to highlight one of the diversification. There is no option of diversification that also mentioned by Mr. Amjad Hassan Choudhury. That diversification is now the dire needs to penetrate to survive after the LDC graduation, to uh, survive as after the COVID situation, because the COVID is also asked for diversification of the market. But I also need to mention that we are losing some of the markets which were lasting in the UK for a long, long time. That is, that is the ethnic market. Ethnic market is also now driving away from Bangladesh. We have the views, vegetable market, shame market, but because of lots of compliance issues, this market is gradually wiping out from the Bangladesh side. So we need to think of regaining those market because uh, vegetables, lots of ethnic vegetable went to there and we have the huge Bangladeshi, they likes the Bangladeshi vegetable and fruits, the Bang uh, Bangladeshi ethnic fruits and also uh, Bangladeshi fishery, fish, shrimp and other fishes. So that market, we also need to think of why it is not uh, um, uh, continuing or the, this market it is shrinking over time because mainly because of compliance and also other issues are also there and I like to uh, which we need to have the uh, highlight and another issue is the uh, that also uh, Rahan mentioned that is the cost of business is very high in fact that is one of the major issues we now need to think we uh, there is no option other than enhancing the productivity of the entrepreneurs to compete with the other competitors because across the globe the duty will decline so your competitive age will decline so issues to survive is the your productivity and enhancement going to that now i like to you know go, highlight on the investment issues I, I, during my tenure in the uk for long six years what i found is that three or four issues we need to highlight one is the regulatory predictability everybody comes and says, say oh why you will change last year the policy was like that but we changed this uh, recently so regulatory we have uh, continuous uh, we remove uh, uh, reform in the policy space, but we need to have a predictable regulatory regime in Bangladesh. Uh, and we, we are doing hard for improving the ease of doing business, but along with the use of business, doing business, we also need to think of worldwide good governance indicators. That gives you how political stability is, how good governance are working. These issues also need to improve, uh, think of, because this gives you the overall picture of the security of the issues of the investment. Uh, the UK uh, people at, uh, that are rightly mentioned by uh, uh, Rahan were interested in investment in Bangladesh and mainly in the service sector. And the service sector, I think, is the IT is one of the service sector. Education. India is taking lots of benefits of the education sector. And because if we can bring the in UK, particularly Oxford, Cambridge, a high ranking university in Bangladesh to set up there, as we can, we can uh, uh, have the graduate, they can also penetrate in the global market in a high skill job. That is also one of the issues. We can also think of uh, developing joint collaboration for carer and nursing services, because if we uh, bring some UK, uh, UK institution, to uh, uh, train our nurse and train according to the UK standard, it can go to the global market. This is what we have the comparative mm -hmm. advantage. We have the big advantage. We need to think of uh, uh, that power and energy is another sector, particularly the waste to energy. I found three or four entrepreneurs who came who were inter really interested to waste to energy project. This is we need to think of. But this is this is the main uh, main mainstream investor but we also think of the ethnic investor in nrbs nrbs have very bitter experience in investing in bangladesh 
at the, at their first generation was deprived in investing their local area. Then they started business, but that was also the some bitter experience. I think. Uh, uh, on that. Now we, they, are, they have huge cash money in hand. Uh, they have huge cash money lying in the different banks in Bangladesh, but that is not going to the channeling to the banking sector. So we can think of investing, those, um, attracting with security, with the assurance that we, that investment can be go to the real investment sector, particularly in the, we can use those investment in the tourism and hospitality sector. And finally, I like to uh, uh, mention one of the issue is the IPR. This is issue is always in the low profile, but this is really, really upcoming challenging issues. And Mukta Dilbhai also can mention about that, that this IPR is related with the pharmaceutical sectors, but it is also related to all other sectors, uh, trade, trade, if uh, my trademarks, so it's not protected, I'll not come to invest in Bangladesh. If my patent is not protected, I'll not come to Bangladesh. These are the issues now we have to think, particularly with the fourth industry revolution and digital economy. These issues will come as upcoming challenges for Bangladesh. With these few words, I'd like to thank you again for inviting me. Thank you all for very patient hearing. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rifa Khan. Uh, very thought-provoking. Um, um, discussion that you have, like the uh, points you mentioned are actually, uh, it is uh, for our own uh, understanding and learning also. You brought up some very interesting points, especially in the education sector, a lot of things can be done. And uh, and, the, and regarding intellectual property, we always say like uh, China, uh, uh, when they started the business, uh, uh, coming up in business, it wasn't an important issue back then. But now uh, intellectual property is, uh, whenever we have discussions, this thing always keeps coming up. Uh, so we need to address that. Enforcement of contracts is also there. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Ipakhan. Uh, at this moment, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Faraz A. Rahim, Executive Director, Remembers Storage, Power and Business. Uh, Faraz? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, you have four minutes, if you can be brief. Uh, your thoughts on today's presentation. And sure, thank you. Seen so, opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Good morning to all the Honorable Minister, High Commissioners and distinguished guests. So thank you for extending the opportunity for me to share my thoughts here. Because I have four minutes, I'll try to go a little bit quickly. I represent Rayma Froze. It's a 65-year-old company with battery exports to 70 international markets and contributing to more than 90% of Bangladesh's export of batteries till 2019. The majority of our batteries and uh, exports are in our own brands, and uh, we have been able to create a demand for made in Bangladesh products in the uh, countries that we've been presented. So uh, today's discussion is more about partnering with the, U uh, with the UK and Bangladesh and how we can actually work together through FDIs. So there are two things that I would like to highlight. One is uh, strategic partnerships uh, in uh, batteries itself, and also the second one is actually a backward integration with uh, recycling. So. UK in the last uh, year, in 2018, has uh, exported almost $292 million worth of batteries, but most of it was to Europe, 66%, and 14% to Asia. While its imports were about 745 million, 53% being from uh, Europe and 41% from Asia. And uh, while UK's export ratio stood at 40%, Bangladesh's export to import ratio stood at 140%. The exports were of batteries were more than uh, imports. And um, the trade relation with the UK uh, was about $3.7 billion, but almost all of this was with the garment sector. While there is enough room for increasing ties with the light engineering sector, as well as through uh, FDIs in joint ventures and strategic partnerships with structured local players. The battery industry has a 15% cash incentive on lead, lead acid battery exports, and any investor will be able to yield higher returns from Bangladesh because the entry into uh, the EU is uh, 0% duty with cash incentives. So plants over here, if uh, the UK decides to put in FDIs in Bangladesh to create uh, uh, buyback uh, options or export to the EU, which is its biggest market, the returns much, uh, can potentially be much higher. Um, on the other hand, the majority of its imports are from Asia itself. So such an arrangement can also help UK buy back from Bangladesh with higher returns and profits for the investors. And uh, more interestingly, with the scrap um, export to Bangladesh, sorry, the, with UK's export to Bangladesh comprising of 50, more than 50% in metals, 
So the 50% of UK's export to Bangladesh is crap. And uh, this is where we can also have a very strong uh, collaboration uh, in backward integration for the battery industry. Uh, because UK investors may consider to partner with the government of Bangladesh along with the Battery Association to create a common battery recycling plant to supply to the manufacturers of lead acid batteries in Bangladesh, which has a market size of about 15,000 metric tons. It is, uh, and uh, there is a special focus on this initiative by the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of Industries also, supported by the Battery Association to bring positive impact to the environment and cr also create a level playing field for the structured uh, battery players. Because the scrap market is currently dominated by unregulated players, the local lead prices being almost 50% higher than import prices, this could be a very lucrative investment uh, for any FDI uh, with the government of Bangladesh. The Bangladesh is also one of the few countries where there's a large base of local manufacturers, but there is no local supply for lead in an organized manner. So, uh, and uh, the lead for a battery manufacturing is almost 80% of its cost. The battery industry today uh, stands at about 59 billion uh, globally with global trade standing at about 20 billion. So there's an ample room for growth in this sector uh, from Bangladesh. And uh, so UK, just to give you a small example into the detail, a UK scrap battery price is for example, $635 per ton. Whereas a uh, refined lead is 2000 metric dollar per ton. And if we convert the scrap from UK to, uh, look, uh, to lead in Bangladesh, it will come to around 15 to $1,600 per metric ton. So it gives a lot of room for uh, value creation in this sector. And uh, this, uh, however, we need to remove the ban on imports of scrap batteries uh, for this purpose. And of course, when the government also comes into the scrap uh, recycling plant with any foreign uh, investment, yeah. um, they will be able to remove this ban, but of course, with a lot of control to a uh, lot of control to prevent misuse of uh, the scrap batteries. Thank you. So, Thank you for us. Uh, uh, it's very interesting that you brought up a <clears throat> sector, uh, which we usually discuss. It, it never gets highlighted. But uh, thank you for bringing out the uh, thing that uh, there's there's an opportunity that FDI can take place in battery recycling, also manufacturing. So uh, uh, and uh, we will also look into that because this is something we never discussed before, and okay. it's a new sector for us. So thank you, thank you for us. Uh, at this point, I would uh, like to request uh, Mr. Abdul Muktadir. Uh, Chairman and Managing Director, Inceptor Pharmaceuticals Limited. Sir, if, um, yes, Dr. if you. you can share your thoughts and views. Yeah, thank you so much. And I appreciate that you have having this particular meeting with the high profile people from almost all of the uh, different organizations and congratulations for that. Uh, we are one of the few organizations who are in fact uh, exporting medicines to UK. And uh, we see tremendous amount of potential in exporting medicine to UK. We have started uh, branding as well as uh, uh, generic export. Although it is tiny and very small at this moment, maybe last year's export was something like uh, three, four million dollars only. But as you know, for any brand, uh, especially in medicines, um, it, it slowly builds up. And we have started that. And UK is a very, very important partner for us, uh, who is providing us bridging service to export to other markets. And uh, we'd like to request His Excellency, the High Commissioner of uh, England, to connect us, Bangladesh, with some very special relationship with our regulatory authority in Bangladesh, with UK MHRA. You know that before uh, Brexit, uh, the EMEA office was in England, and they were providing tremendous amount of service to the whole European Union. Now, because of this disengagement, UK MHRA has tremendous amount of capability uh, underutilized. So if we can seek some kind of relationship with UK MHRA in drug regulation and registration, that would place Bangladesh into a next level from which we can actually make very, very big export of pharmaceuticals. Because pharmaceuticals are 
actually highly regulated substances, and it requires registration in an advanced country. And if we get our registration in UK, that gives access to virtually the whole world. I give you one very simple example. We, we wanted to export a medicine into United Arab Emirates, Dubai, and they wanted to give us a price of only $3 a pack. And then we registered that product in UK. And since it is released, uh, tested, uh, so it was actually U UK product. So it, it, it has a name that it is made in UK or a UK product, but manufactured in Bangladesh under contract manufacturing. And we have a profit split proposition with a UK company. And that same product we sell at a price of $11 a, a pack. So you can imagine with $3, I have a profit of only maybe 50 cents. And with $11, even if I am going to go and split uh, the profit with him, I have a profit of $4 a pack. So this is the kind of value addition. I'm, I'm giving you a very, uh, very open trade secret to you. This is the kind of value addition UK can bring in, in to us. So we have made a tremendous amount of uh, shift in our attitude that instead of going all by ourselves, we will go to all Commonwealth countries through UK, whereby we can actually make tremendous amount of value addition to Bangladesh as well as to UK together. So I would urge our honorable, uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, uh, High Commissioner of uh, UK, to pay a very special attention, the collaboration between UK MHRA, which is their regulatory body with Bangladesh, so that Bangladesh regulation can be uplifted a little bit and we can have this kind of mutual recognition and we can go to the whole world. The other issue is uh, we, we, the UK, U, UK generic market is very, very tough. The total market is about uh, four or five uh, billion pounds and but manufacturer selling price is something like uh, two to 2.5 billion pounds. And uh, we have taken an initiative that will we'll have it completely um, like, uh, integrated from API to finished product manufacturing, and we'll get into UK in a very big way. If we can do that, there is every possibility that we would probably be able to uh, go to level something like almost like a hundred million pounds in UK. It's possible. And and if uh, uh, my other uh, uh, colleague industries, if they come, fellow industries, if they come, we can probably go something like uh, three to four hundred billion million pounds in UK. It is possible. So we need a very concrete plan how to go ahead with this. And and we found out that UK is extremely uh, the attitude of UK is extremely favorable towards Bangladesh after Brexit because they also needed a similar country like Bangladesh who can who can come forward with India plus because UK is completely dependent on their generic medicine to India and they really wanted to have another one country as a, a second source of very vital life-saving medicines. So this is extremely, this is doable. This is possible, but we need a plan. So we need to chalk out a plan with uh, commerce ministry, uh, with UK government, and especially the regulators. These are extremely important. I would like to touch upon another one area uh, besides uh, pharmaceuticals. We are going in the right speed that I think we'd be able to achieve tremendous amount of success in, in pharmaceuticals in UK. But another one area that must be addressed now, if we really want Bangladesh to uh, come to the forefront of development, high quality development and value addition development. That is the education sector. If we had uh, Oxford, Cambridge, these kind of universities campus in Bangladesh, that is going to make a geometric shift uh, in, 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 in Bangladesh. Uh, and if we can bring, is, bring in these educational institutes in Bangladesh, within five years time, we can achieve such a tremendous amount of um, amount of uh, accelerated growth is going to be unbelievable. But mind it, please, we have to bring in engineering and basic science. 
not uh, other things. So we, we are interested more on engineering and science. If we can bring in those subjects here, that would be wonderful. The other issue I'd like to inform you that I'm personally working with one person whose name is David, uh, David Satok, who is the Professor David Satok. He is the head of the vaccine research in Imperial College, and he has made a self-amplifying uh, RNA vaccine, which is going to go uh, into uh, clinical trials in UK. And we are working with his lab, our scientists go and get trained in his lab. And if these vaccines become successful in COVID, then we are going to manufacture with them here in Bangladesh. I wish it becomes successful. So I ask our, um, uh, his, uh, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner of uh, uh, Bangladesh in UK, to uh, have uh, some communication established with Imperial College with David Setok so that this vaccine can also be brought into Bangladesh. And I thank uh, Mr. Shams for giving me these opportunities to say a few words. And it was a fantastic argument that has been made. Thanks for, for this, this kind of leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Muktadir, and uh, wish you uh, we wish you all the best uh, regarding the vaccine. Hope it, it is a success. And uh, this is the kind of story we want to highlight to uh, uh, when we talk about Bangladesh, the success story of Bangladesh. These are the sort of stories we want to highlight. And uh, these are out of the box uh, sectors. And uh, I hope the government, when they formulate policies, will also engage with the private sector and especially. Uh, uh, with uh, investors and business people who, who always thinks outside the box when formulating policy. Thank you again, once again, Mr. Mukherjee. I just, just wanted to give you one more information uh, that uh, uh, we are going to launch uh, another one product in 1st of September. And this is a, uh, a product, uh, very spatially made product and some kind of quasi branded product. Uh, it's hydroxychloroquine 300 milligram especially used for arthritic patients in UK. So uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, possibility of success of one single product, and uh, we are going to launch that on 1st of September. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, I would like to request uh, Saad Almas Kubir, president of DASIS, uh, to say a few words, and especially to uh, touch upon the IT sector and AI for uh, IR, uh, because these things are what we are talking about at the moment. So uh, what is BASIS doing and your thoughts on today's presentation? Thank you, Almas Bhai. Thank you. Thank you, Shams. Um, Honorable uh, State Minister, um, the Honorable High Commissioners, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, I, I really feel very much privileged to be included in this distinguished panel. Um, as um, the president of DCCI has said, that um, we have been working on uh, developing skills in the frontier technologies. Um, before that, I just want to uh, give you a number that, uh, as you know, that previous year, um, not this year, previous year, we reached $1 billion in export of uh, software and IT enabled services. And um, UK was the second uh, largest destination after the US. US was the biggest so far, um, and uh, UK comprised of about 13%, one three, 13% of the total um, export, which comes to about uh, 130 million US dollars, which I think is very low. It can be actually 10 times more what we have been doing with uh, UK. The problem that I see um, is that the biggest problem uh, is the image crisis. Um, because of the branding of Bangladesh for the last 40 years have been the country of uh, cheap labor. And of course, that has been advantageous to us because we have done very well in the RMG sector. So that branding has, um, that is the branding, that is the image that we are struggling uh, with now. Uh, because IT is a high skill uh, sector, people do not, you know, they, they really need to uh, think Bangladesh as a destination of not cheap labor, but skilled labor. So that is what we really need to do right now. And we are uh, talking to the ICD division and Ministry of Commerce that how we can use our embassies and high commissions um, uh, in different countries and how we can change this image. Um, anyway, um, so as we were talking about that 
mainly what we have been selling or rather exporting were like some graphics processing, some animation, 2D and 3D animation, uh, and this sort of uh, things. In the COVID-19 situation, of course, for the first two months, we were like taken aback and um, all the export contracts were like canceled and um, we were like in quite a dire straits. But then in June onwards, we thought that we would, this lean period should be utilized. And what we did is uh, for since June onwards, we have started providing and training uh, people and developing IT professionals in the frontier technologies. As you were saying, that technologies that are needed to um, uh, in, the, in the fourth industrial revolution, like uh, IoT, like big data, like blockchain, et cetera, like artificial intelligence, et cetera. So now we have, and in the next few months, we will have a very good, uh, rich pool of um, highly skilled IT professionals. And I think we can utilize this um, in the, in the uh, next year. Um, and uh, we will be able to expand the export uh, market, uh, especially in UK as well. And of course, we will need the help of the, uh, Her Excellency, uh, the High Commissioner. And I, I hope to have a separate meeting with her on, the, on this. Um, I think the image crisis that I was talking about, that Rebranding has to be done very, very, uh, it has to be done in a, in a very thoughtful manner. It will not happen overnight, but uh, if we have to, I mean, we have to start. And if we can start now, we can actually reap the benefit um, maybe in, in the next few years. Another thing that I want to touch upon is that, as you know, that because of the fourth industrial revolution, our industries will adapt the robotics, industrial robots, I mean, uh, especially the RMG industry. And UK has um, a few companies that actually manufactures uh, good uh, high profile industrial robots like Geku and Global Robots and Omron. These are some brand names from the UK. So they manufacture these uh, industrial robots. I would encourage um, these companies to come to Bangladesh, invest here and maybe in, the, in our high tech parks and start assembling these industrial robots, especially for the RMG industries in the in Bangladesh high-tech parks. What will happen is uh, if we can do that, two things will happen. Our RMG industry will be able to tap into this and get these industrial robots and they can deploy these robots at a very cheap price. They can also uh, get the after sale support at a, at a low cost. And the, the best thing that will happen is the technology transfer and the knowledge transfer that, that will happen. So this, um, we really need to think about it and um, you know, ask these industrial robotic com companies, uh, as, I, as I was um, naming a few, to come to Bangladesh and set up their assembling factories and maybe uh, some R&D fa uh, facilities in our high-tech parks. We have the skilled people, so that is not a problem. Uh, it's just we need to communicate uh, with the market um, and we need to let the world know that we have capable and um, it's no longer, Bangladesh is no longer a country of cheap labor, it's a country of skilled labor. So you can get high quality outputs, high quality products and services out of Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Almas. Uh, and uh, we know like this is the way forward. So we will have a lot of engagements in the coming days, especially touching upon on 4IR, AI and uh, new sectors, as you mentioned, like robotics, assembly of ro uh, robots uh, to be used for 4IR is another potential sector we should be looking into. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I just want to say that we do not want to remain that the manufacturing manufacturing country of RMG only, but we maybe in, uh, in, in, a, in a very few, you know, uh, in the next few years, uh, these RMG, these ready-made garments will be manufactured in Europe and America with the robots. But at that time, we want to become a country of who will be supplying these robots, you know, um, not, not selling RMGs, but supplying the robots that which those robots will be actually making the RMG in Europe and America. So that is the Thank way, you. I mean, yeah. we should actually think about it. Thank you, Almas. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, uh, I would like to request uh, Mr. Hussein Khalid, Managing Director, Anwar Group of Industries, 
and former president of BCCI to um, your um, to share his reflections and thoughts and um, regarding the FTA with the UK, uh, what can be done and uh, uh, about today's presentation. We have been presented with a lot of new um, sectors and uh, uh, even uh, which we traditionally ignore. So, and we also know that uh, Mr. Uh, Khaled is, uh, was the founder of entrepreneur uh, organization in Bangladesh, EO, uh, where it is a combination of upcoming uh, businessmen in Bangladesh. Um, so Khaled Bhai, we know that uh, this is your forte. So your thoughts and reflections, thank you. Uh, thank you, President. Assalamu alaikum uh, and very good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would also like to congratulate Mr. Raihan for the uh, for the very good presentation. It was uh, a, uh, indeed uh, from a very macro level perspective. It was uh, you know an icebreaker to get the discussions going, and I can already foresee how uh, you know a lot of the micro. Uh, uh, issues that you already pointed out needs to be discussed a lot more in depth. Now, just to supplement, uh, I'll take one minute to supplement some of your uh, findings. You know, a very interesting um, way to translate the total import of UK, which is about $692 billion uh, in a year. Uh, if we divide that by 67 million uh, people or population in UK that comes translates to about a demand of $10,000 per person per year. Whereas our contribution to that $10,000 is extremely uh, little uh, as you have pointed out. Um, and of course, uh, you know, as you have also rightly pointed out that our diversification is one of the biggest challenge. 93% of our total exports to the UK represents uh, ready-made garments in different aspects. And the rest, 7%, honestly, uh, we still have not been able to uh, exploit the opportunity yet. I still see uh, in some of the areas where we have developed some expertise, or uh, say, for example, what uh, Mr. Muktadir Bhai has already mentioned, uh, of the total $692 billion worth of imports, 4% is pharmaceuticals. Whereas we are just starting, it's we are still on the tip of the iceberg, if I may say. Uh, it's the same with uh, jute, footwear, whether it's leather, whether it's non-leather, whether it's fabrics. See, these are areas where we have already developed uh, expertise. And we need to see how we can exploit the market and gain our market share in these areas, first of all. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, Sharifa Khan, Ms., uh, Mr. Sharifa Khan from Ministry of Commerce has actually identified all of the, or most of the areas which our private sector has always spoken of. And she has always been a very strong voice for us. But yes, cost of doing business, uh, is a major challenge. Uh, on the doing business index, where we have brought in some improvement and FBCCI has actually done a lot of work, but the amount of improvement or the change that we brought in definitely was not sufficient. We need to be a lot more progressive in bringing in these changes and bringing in uh, a lot or reducing a lot of these red tapes. Uh, one of the best initiative uh, the present government has taken is the special economic zones. Uh, but unfortunately, we still do not see a lot of uh, investments being attracted from the UK. Uh, it could be partially that, uh, you know, maybe our marketing efforts are still not uh, sufficient enough for us to promote that even though I'm like, when we talk about domestic investments versus investments in special economic zones, the policy and the criteria are absolutely different. And it's extremely user friendly or investment friendly, but unfortunately, we still have not capitalized on that yet. Uh, of course, a lot of those other issues uh, like productivity, skill development has already been mentioned. 
Uh, I would like to bring up one example uh, of the automotive industry in China, which over the last 30 or 40 years were developed by most of the major manufacturers. And after 30 to 40 years, now they have become one of the largest exporters and manufacturers for the globe, for the world. You know, we need to take certain initiatives like that, whereby we can actually create that complete value chain in Bangladesh, whether it's in garments, whether it's in pharmaceuticals, we need to go towards uh, from starting from research and development and going all the way to meeting demands of UK. Uh, Mr. President, as you may already know that uh, UK themselves are a net FDI attractor and they attracted $2.1 trillion worth of foreign investments, which is the highest in Europe. And if I'm not mistaken, second highest in the world. So obviously for them to invest in a foreign country like Bangladesh, return on investment is definitely a must, but more than that, it's always the opportunity that needs to be exploited. And I personally foresee that we have not been able to exploit and represent uh, Bangladeshi businesses abroad. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Bangladesh is actually a very different uh, uh, has very different characteristic, if I may say, we are very import dependent and also very export oriented. Because of the fact that we do not have that many raw materials or resources, we have to import our raw materials, process it, and then try to export. And in the meantime, develop that domestic, uh, domestic uh, demand and domestic market. Uh, given that, we also need to keep in mind that uh, with the growing uh, purchasing power, we need to attract service industries from the UK who can actually exploit and take us to that next level. And by that, I am referring to joint ventures. I personally see that, uh, you know, uh, the experience that the, the local investors or businesses have gathered in fighting these challenges, the red tapism, that could be overcome with joint ventures. Uh, another big challenge that we continuously face when it comes to foreign investment is uh, the capital gain tax. One is the capital gain tax and the other one is uh, the dividend tax. So for foreign investors, the first thing that they would like to see is their uh, you know, exit strategies, their profit repatriations. And whenever that comes, we unfortunately are still one of the highest in the region. Uh, I can give you an example that, uh, you know, between India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Vietnam, we are the highest when it comes to capital gain tax, as well as dividend tax. Hence, we are also the lowest when it comes to trade. We have the lowest foreign participation uh, in total trade. So that I would, uh, you know, I would highly encourage that that needs to be looked into and brought at par, if not lower than others, at least at par with, uh, with the rest of the uh, countries in the economy. Thank you, President. Thank you so much, uh, Khalid Bhai. Uh, as always, you have um, brought up some very interesting points and uh, beautifully explained the problems that the business, the private sector in Bangladesh faces. Um, and also for FDA, the bottlenecks. I think like uh, one of the main problems we always, uh, we uh, seldom discuss is the issue of taxation and with especially the NBR. Um, uh, I think uh, this needs to be done because uh, for the economic zones, I think the economic zones authority should be empowered to take decisions regarding taxation inside the zones because we always hear this problem like uh, when it comes to bond inspection and things like that it creates a sour uh, atmosphere uh, for the existing investors so uh, i think uh, these sort of authors needs to be more empowered and thank you once again Khaled Bhai. Uh, i would now request uh, mr asif ibrahim um, Chairman Chitong Stock Exchange and uh, former president Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry and also a director of BGMA. So uh, 
Asupai, uh, I will request you to touch upon three aspects. Uh, the capital market, especially as regards to Bangla bond, the success story of Bangla bond, uh, your thoughts, uh, the way forward, because it is a new sector for us as well, and uh, a potential avenue for closer cooperation between the UK and Bangladesh, uh, uh, the business communities, and also regarding uh, RMG sector, um, if you can briefly touch upon that, because we, uh, to this discussion, we actually want to explore new avenues, what more can be done? because we always are talking about the traditional sector. So we want to look past this and go forward. So thank you. Asupai, your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much. The chair of today's uh, webinar president of the CCI, uh, the uh, chief guest, uh, excellency minister, the excellency high commissioner, and the keynote presenter and distinguished panelists uh, of today's uh, webinar. Uh, I would uh, first like to congratulate Selim Bhai for a wonderful uh, presentation that he has uh, come up with. Particularly, I was quite impressed with the slide where he mentioned uh, UK's uh, investment, return on investment across the region. Uh, that is an eye opener. And also you have categorized the uh, different sectors where uh, UK has uh, foreign direct investment and uh, you have identified the percentages, which is quite beneficial for Bangladesh as we are trying to attract more foreign direct investment to uh, help us uh, get through this uh, the economic uh, uh, crisis that we are facing because of the uh, COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, I would first want to start off with the ready-made garment sector as uh, the president has requested me. Uh, the, uh, the, in the presentation, uh, Dr. Selim Raihan showed overall export over a period of I think 10 years. Uh, uh, I would just like to say that from the year 2014-15 sure. up to 2018 and 19, uh, we have had growth of uh, exports to the, uh, to the UK uh, from $2.9 billion to $3.8 billion. Apart from the year 2016-17, where we experienced a minor dip, we have been able to maintain the growth. And it is clearly evident that the growth is more uh, you can see uh, more growth in the knitwear sector than in the womenwear sector. So it is encouraging that the growth is going on, but it will be very interesting to see uh, after uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic, what, what would be the figures of export. The reason being, I'm telling you, is because uh, as we have said, at the exception of the pandemic, there has been uh, uh, quite a substantial amount of uh, orders which were kept on hold by the UK buyers. Uh, totaling to 76 million uh, 513,000 pieces, uh, which uh, uh, if you quantify, it's about $2.93 billion worth of exports. And, and the number of workers who work in these factories are 1.65 million workers. However, we have seen that uh, some of those orders have uh, come back, which is an encouraging sign. Uh, I have mentioned the orders which was kept on hold. Now I will talk about the orders which were canceled by the British buyers. That amount is uh, 2,289,000 uh, some pieces, uh, which, is, uh, which is about $95 million worth of cancellations. Now, in terms of uh, going forward for the uh, uh, particular the RMG sector, I would highly uh, uh, encourage that we uh, uh, look at the areas of uh, diversified product amongst uh, uh, the sector itself, within the sector itself, Particularly, we clearly see that a report that has been recently launched by PricewaterhouseCoopers that we have an over-dependence on, uh, on cotton-based uh, products in Bangladesh, where the global uh, trend seems to be more on, uh, on uh, man-made fiber. So there is an opportunity for investments in UK. I know there are many UK companies, the textile industry has a traditional heritage in the UK, and then it shifted to different parts of the world. But there, is, uh, there are companies in the UK who have production companies based in Korea, based in Thailand, based in Malaysia, based in Indonesia, who are operating. They could look into perhaps relocating some of these industries into Bangladesh, particularly in the area of man-made fiber. Uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the capital markets uh, that you wanted me to talk about, a very interesting uh, 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 aspect that was mentioned in Dr. Selim's presentation was that I, we saw that financial and insurance sector 
uh, in terms of foreign direct investment from UK is 37% uh, across the countries where they have invested. In. in Bangladesh, there is a tremendous opportunity. We have uh, uh, the two capital, uh, the stock markets in Bangladesh, Dhaka Stock uh, Exchange and Chittagong Stock Exchange. And we have almost two crore uh, retail investors in this country. Now, Bangladesh capital market is going through a transformation, uh, going towards automation. Uh, it is, it was, it's going through that transformation process. A new commission has also come in. And uh, I, I definitely see a lot of opportunities in the area of fintech from UK companies uh, to engage with uh, Bangladesh capital market in, the, in this area. And because we, as, as, as the new commissioner and the commission has said that within two years, they wish to see uh, uh, investors uh, across the uh, uh, platform trade in telephone. Uh, 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 so that, that's an, a big opportunity that, that I can see. Uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the Bangla bond, I think this is a tremendous success. Uh, I think this, is, this was the first time a Bangladeshi corporate has been able to raise capital uh, outside Bangladesh uh, in, uh, uh, in London. So I want to see more and more of uh, Bangladeshi companies uh, going uh, and following the example of the Bangla bond and also setting up uh, more and more, uh, uh, get, trying to get more finance from, uh, from uh, the, the, the UK, the London Stock Exchange. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the, uh, coming back to the FDI, I think uh, we saw that, uh, uh, you know, the percentage in terms of UK's overall FDI, India was about 6.6%, oh, sorry, 66, uh, I think it was. Pakistan was 3.75 and Bangladesh was near 0.37%. Uh, because of the historical relationship that we had with, uh, the, with, the, with the, uh, in, uh, the British Empire, we were obviously, these three countries were part of the Indian subcontinent. So we wish to see more foreign direct investment from that uh, perspective into Bangladesh as well as uh, the Vietnam example was cited by Dr. Selim Raihan. A lot of that foreign direct investment from U.S. companies are actually uh, uh, not uh, just basically based on economic uh, uh, returns, but also from the perspective of the legacy of the Vietnam uh, War. Uh, so I would like to see that uh, uh, happening more. Uh, in terms of the, uh, of the argument that we, we have ha had, uh, uh, not an argument, basically, uh, that whether we should proceed uh, with uh, uh, FTA discussions with UK, uh, I certainly think we should start the process. Uh, the Ministry of Commerce representative, who's, who's an expert, she's, she's uh, had an extensive experience in dealing with this matter. Uh, the ministry perhaps does not feel the need to uh, engage right now as because of the extended uh, uh, benefits that we would be given under the unilateral benefit under the, under the EU uh, scheme uh, uh, before termination of the EBA benefits, uh, I would strongly urge that we should start at least the process uh, because uh, as we can see in the global trade paradigm, there is a, uh, a shift from, uh, from a multilateral trade uh, uh, preferences based trading system to a more regional and more bilateral based uh, trading preferential uh, preferential trade system. So we should certainly look into engaging more uh, and particularly with the United Kingdom as they are our, one of our biggest trading partners. Uh, I think I have covered most of what you wanted to hear. I would stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Asifai, uh, for um, covering most of the topics uh, we wanted to know about. Uh, at this moment, I would uh, like to start the Q and A session. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, the chairman of Build, uh, Mr. Abul Kasim Khan, also former president of Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Khan. Uh, yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Audible. Thank you. Thank you, Shams. Um, I'll just point out some of the advantages for Bangladesh. Uh, we have location advantage. Uh, we are between the two Asian giants of India and China. So that gives us a huge market access. We are close to the ASEAN uh, grouping. So that's, that's another market access. Uh, we have recently been given the 
duty-free access to the Chinese market. So that, that opens up a new dimension for Bangladesh and the UK companies can come here and, and do joint ventures, which Mr. Khaled pointed out, and probably export to the Chinese market. That's a huge advantage. 97% of the market has been given duty-free access. Demographic dividend is something very important. Very interesting for Bangladesh. We will have demographic dividend until the year 2042. And we have one of the largest labor forces we, uh, because we are the eighth largest country in terms of population. Uh, growth advantage, we, we, were, we are one of the fastest growing countries uh, until the COVID happened. And we are predicted to be uh, one of the fastest growing countries until the year 2050. And we will be larger than uh, 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 Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Malaysia by the year 2050. So the huge growth op uh, opportunities for Bangladesh, which the British uh, UK companies can take advantage. Um, opportunity advantage. I think um, Dr. Raihan pointed out a very interesting uh, figure about Bangladesh's FDI to GDP, which is close to 1.1 or 1.5%, which is very low. And what we, uh, we calculated that Bangladesh needs to get about 6% of its GDP into infrastructure investment. We are now doing about 2 to 3%. So if you do 6% to GDP as a developing country, if you see the East Asian countries, even if you talk about China, South Korea, they invested about 10% of their uh, uh, infra into infrastructure as per the GDP uh, contribution. Bangladesh is doing only 2 to 3%. We need to be at least at 6%, which, which amounts to about 18 to $20 billion of investment needed only in infrastructure. And, and most of this infrastructure currently that the government is investing is, is to the public funds. So there is a huge opportunity for private sector to be engaged through joint ventures, through direct FDI injection by uh, UK and other countries. So this is something maybe the UK uh, companies will be very interested. Uh, coming back to something else, Commonwealth advantage. We, we are part of the Commonwealth. I think there, there can be opportunities to trade within the Commonwealth through certain uh, trade benefits. This is something I would request the Honorable High Commissioner to look into how we can develop this kind of a new avenue of business. Uh, free trade agreement, which the, uh, all the discussions pointed out is very important for Bangladesh. Uh, just to coming back, um, which I think all the discussions kind of pointed out, Bangladesh needs to obviously improve its competitiveness. We have seen that we are not competitive in the tax structure. We're not competitive in the in a lot of indexes which which come out every year. So the, I know the government is working. Um, I, I think we will have some positive impact after this year. A lot of uh, input from the government, ha private sector has gone in. The one-stop service is coming about, which will be a game changer for Bangladesh, as, as we hope that the uh, business uh, processes will improve. So uh, I would I would limit uh, my uh, my points here. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ake Khan. Uh, just to inform everyone that uh, DCCI will be the first private sector chamber in Bangladesh to sign uh, the one-stop uh, service agreement with BIDA this coming Thursday. And at the same time, uh, we are uh, looking to engage, uh, especially with BEZA, when it comes to reforms to attract FDI. So we are working on that. And we will have we will hold a series of uh, seminars like today's one, uh, uh, addressing different uh, sectors and um, scopes to go forward. Thank you. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I would like to uh, request uh, a, a special guest, uh, His Excellency Mr. Robert Chatterton Dixon, British High Commissioner to Bangladesh today, to share his thoughts on today's presentation and today's webinar. Uh, we know that uh, you have another engagement uh, um, uh, uh, in 15 minutes, so uh, we would like to have you with us uh, for as long as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, this has been extremely interesting. I have to say I was extremely impressed by the quality of the presentation, which I thought covered all the right, uh, all the right issues. Um, I mean, I think the key point I take away from all of this is how strong the foundation is 
for um, bilateral trade and investment between the UK and Bangladesh, but how much scope there is for us uh, to do more. Um, we are keen, uh, now that we have left the European Union, we're in the process of going through an integrated review of our whole strategic posture, and we're very keen as a country to do more uh, in Indo-Pacific. And I think there's a real opportunity for uh, Bangladesh to be a, a crucial part of that as we lead more into the opportunities in the uh, Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific uh, region. Um, I think a lot of the discussion has been highly relevant to the sort of conversations that we have uh, all the time. And in particular, um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to develop um, the relationship in services. Um, I was very pleased that London was the place where the Bangla bond, the first Bangla bonds were floated. London is the biggest, deepest, most versatile capital pool in the world. Uh, Bangladesh is going to need to raise a lot more private capital to sustain growth over the next decade. And I think there's a really tremendous opportunity for uh, Bangladeshi companies and corporates to be looking to London, um, taking advantage of the sort of trail that uh, Pran blazed um, earlier or uh, at the end of last year. So I'm very, very keen for that finance opportunity to be taken. And I was very interested uh, during the discussion how, what a strong emphasis there was on education. Uh, because I think it's these high-end services, these really uh, these services like education, finance, and indeed health, where UK companies have a really strong um, proposition to offer, where I think we can really build the relationship in the way, a way that would be good for both sides. Uh, on education, there is a lot of interest, I would note, in, um, among UK companies, among UK universities, in establishing a presence in Bangladesh, and there's increasing interest in the secondary sector as well, so schools are very interested. What I would note is that there's a slight problem where the sort of glittering prospect of doing business in Bangladesh meets the day-to-day -day reality, where universities still find that the Cross-Border Higher Education Act, which was passed five years ago, is still not being implemented in a way that enables uh, foreign universities, including UK universities, to establish themselves here. And I think what that highlights is the wider issue uh, around ease of doing business, because UK companies look at uh, the fantastic opportunity of the eighth largest country in the world by population, uh, growing at 8% uh, pre-COVID, and I very much hope bouncing back uh, to sustain strong growth after that. Uh, they see this glittering prospect, they see the very strong uh, performance of UK companies already here. They look at companies like HSBC, Standard Chartered, Unilever, who all do very good business in Bangladesh, uh, and they are very excited by the potential uh, but then they look at some of the issues that are raised by ease of doing business uh, and they become concerned. Uh, so I think it's really important that companies see that there's a level playing field here. They see that their intellectual property is going to be protected. They see that they can enforce contracts. So a lot of that basic reform, I think, is what needs to happen uh, if companies are going to really make the most uh, of the tremendous uh, opportunities which exist here. Um, just a couple of things that I particularly picked up on uh, from the discussion. I was very interested in the uh, discussion about standards in pharmaceuticals and the use of the UK as an access point for the wider global uh, economy, and in particular for the Commonwealth. I think there's a real opportunity for us to do uh, value uh, addition around that. And I was also very struck by the role that UK buyers are already playing in encouraging the, um, the, the, the diversification of, um, of the Bangladesh economy. So new sectors like pharmaceuticals, like electronics, like IT services, uh, and like bicycles. It's really great to see that companies are already uh, engaging there. Uh, and I very much hope that those will be the sort of sectors uh, that it'll be possible to uh, really build on uh, as we look for the next decade of strong growth in Bangladesh uh, to be beneficial both to Bangladeshi companies, we hope exporting a wider range of products into the UK, but also UK companies uh, making the most of the opportunities that uh, Bangladesh presents. And I just finished by saying that we in the High Commission, uh, we have a trade team, of course we have a large development team, we're about to be working together as the new Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, and we are very much here to enable and encourage businesses from both sides uh, to take advantage of the economic opportunities as part of our wider uh, reorientation as part of Brexit uh, towards this very exciting and fast-growing part of the world. So we're absolutely with you, very committed to do the most of that. And I'm very grateful uh, to the DAFA Chamber of Commerce and Industry for organizing such a very high grade discussion today. I think it's been really excellent. Very great to see such fantastic participation. Uh, and I think this is just the start, I hope, of a whole series of conversations with participants in the seminar, which we in the High Commission will be looking to take forward. So thank you very much indeed.
Thank you so much, uh, Excellency, uh, for your speech. And uh, uh, on, from behalf of Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we would like to work more closely with the uh, High Commission uh, to explore avenues of uh, cooperation. And especially with B2B matchmaking is something we would like, uh, if uh, we can help, we are uh, here. Um, and um, so hopefully in the coming days, we will do some work together. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, I would like to request uh, our special guest, uh, Her Excellency Ms. Saida Muna Taslim, uh, Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK, uh, Ireland and Liberia, to say a few words. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, again, I'm extremely grateful to you, Excellency, because we know that it, it was very early in the morning when you joined us, and you still took the time to, to join this event. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Honorable State Minister for Foreign Affairs must have joined us, so my salam to him. And, uh, you know, um, a very good morning to my time to um, Robert as well. Uh, thanks for a very uh, encouraging statement that he just made. And I would like to thank you for inviting me here. And what an enterprising young group of um, second generation businessmen that I see across the table uh, with you chairing the DCCI. So um, I think the entire tone of this uh, conversation and this interaction has been extremely eye-opening and um, extremely energizing, I would say, and uh, not the traditional conversations that we had when we just say there's tremendous potential. But actually, we touched upon quite a few areas that I have taken frantic notes and my commercial counselor, Mr. Zafari, has also joined. And um, I would like to also acknowledge uh, Professor um, uh, uh, Professor, uh, the presentation that was made by um, Salim Rahim. Professor Salim Rahim, I'm sorry. Um, I would like to thank him for that because you know his presentation again touched upon all the buttons that needed to be touched upon, um, and um, I might lose my battery. I'm actually out of London, so I came here for an official visit. So I'm actually sitting in a hotel lobby. Uh, as I hope uh, my phone doesn't go off. I would like to just touch upon a few issues that the High Commission has taken the initiative. So first of all, before going there, I'd like to, before Robert leaves, I don't know if he's left, you know, we need to, why is it that Bangladesh is not in the due strategic importance of the United Kingdom? That is some, something that we have to focus on. Um, India and Pakistan, they had, uh, you know, um, became independent in 47 and their relationship had actually started from 47. Bangladesh's relationship started much later in 1971. And our garment industry you know, started its business from the 80s. So we came into the picture of bilateral trade, uh, perhaps in the 90s. But the narrative that Bangladesh-UK bilateral relations has from the UK side, it's my experience here, is that it's still very much you know, uh, development assistance centric and extremely Rohingya centric, rather than the two important pillars of our bilateral relations, which should be trade, in, uh, trade investment and also a diaspora. That's what's very extremely important part because 1.2 billion, 1.3 billion US dollars were sent last year. And that needs to be like uh, Sharifa uh, Appa had mentioned that, you know, how to utilize it into productive sector. So these three pillars, you know, our father of the nation, Bangabundu, pioneered the relationship. But it's, it, next year will be uh, 50 years of Bangladesh UK diplomatic relations. And we must have a very, very uh, interesting story to tell on the 50th anniversary of our relationship. And in that story, trade, investment, and economic, geoeconomic importance of Bangladesh to the United Kingdom must be highlighted. Um, coming back to uh, you know, uh, changing the narrative, um, I have seen that in last uh, one and a half year uh, here as High Commissioner, I have sent quite a few proposals of investment. It'll be $6 billion in total. So it was uh, Paira, Dhaka Paira Bondor um, rail connectivity. One is manual, the other one is electric, so 1 billion, 5 billion there. Another one is a power plant, including renewable energy. But <clears throat> it's very difficult to get response from the government or there is no interest uh, in, in actually, um, I, I don't know why, but you know, again, this, these proposals were brought in by Bangladeshi British businessmen and they brought in their white friends. I'm sorry for the racial comment, but you know, British English friends, but I haven't received you know, we have gone out in last one year, we've done this um, three uh, IT related um, uh, investment seminars where ICT minister came. And, you know, IT sector in the UK, it's, the UK has the third largest 
uh, unicorn companies in the world in startups that goes to 1 billion. And then, you know, in terms of FinTech is the second highest. So I really try to connect the IT and I know that you spoke about IT, including uh, robotics and AI. And we tried to bring the best. We did uh, do, uh, you know, facilitated uh, Nogo, then Skrill Money Transfer, MOU last year. But we also facilitated the Bangla bond and um, uh, uh, the MD uh, acknowledged that. But what's important is we did these seminars where we tried to in encourage and, you know, the British Computing Agency uh, Association and other IT sectors. Uh, but normally the British mainstream chambers uh, are very unaware of Bangladesh. It's very, it's a, it's a big challenge. So we, uh, what we tried to do is, you know, when I came, I went to Lord Mayor's office, I went to British chamber and I realized that Lord Mayor, no high commission has gone there. So Lord Mayor doesn't visit Bangladesh, but Lord Mayor is the, uh, is like the FBCCI of uh, London Stock Exchange. On the other hand, British chamber, and I'll encourage DCCI to become a member of the British chamber, British chamber and FBCCI do not have any strategic connectivity. So there is this lack of connectivity from every side. And from UK side, of course, you know, why is it that uh, in the presentation, uh, the professor mentioned that you know, there are countries where the rate of return is not high, but geostrategically or geopolitically, that country is valued much higher than Bangladesh. Uh, and that also has to be taken into consideration. So profiling Bangladesh's importance to UK is also very important. Changing this narrative is also very important. Coming back to um, you know the um, uh, new sectors, diversification of trade, extremely important. If you uh, one more sector regarding RMG, I'd like to mention, is that you know you, uh, the professors um, pointed out that the volume of uh, you know there has been growth, but you know in terms of real value, so volume versus value of RMG has gone down. That's because the UK retailers are paying less. They used to pay five dollars, just for example, five years ago. Today they're paying three dollars. That business model has to be reviewed uh, in the crisis when we, the UK retailers were not paying. Uh, we realized that this business model is not sustainable. In this business model, every liability is with the supplier. That has to change too. So we need to look at more sustainable business models when it comes to RNG. And we must not ignore RNG because that is uh, that already has the capacity. We need to increase productivity, but we must not overlook it because that's what we have. So conserving what we have in a post-Brexit, post-COVID era is extremely important. We must conserve what we have and we must build on it. And then we must add diversification and FDI. In terms of diversification, I'd just like to respond to uh, Muktadir Bhai. I had written to AstraZeneca and I've also written to Imperial and I had asked Bangladesh to be included. First of all, why can't Bangladesh, uh, as you know that AstraZeneca has given the licensing to India's Serum Institute. And uh, we are supposed to uh, get it from Serum Institute to a dist distributor, but I had written to AstraZeneca and Imperial Cars whenever they do the third phase to include Bangladesh in the, in the, um, in the um, vaccine trial uh, phase, as well as uh, Bangladeshi uh, vaccine manufacturers. Why can't they have the licensing? They should do a dialogue. So I'm trying to facilitate the dialogue, but um, you know, the answer was no already. So uh, we are going to speak to British government to facilitate the process, but um, uh, even though Bangladeshi companies, and I'm really looking towards, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical exports that uh, uh, Inceptor has started, but pharmaceutical has been a major focus. I have been in dialogue with Bexinco and Inceptor uh, regarding PPE, uh, regarding, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, but also IT sector. I think that it is really, really underutilized. Someone mentioned that, you know, 13%, yes, uh, UK is the second highest destination of Bangladesh's IT, but we really haven't. So there's a British Computing Association where Sri Lanka's 5,000 companies are registered, but there's not a single Bangladesh company that's registered. So I have spoken to ICT minister regarding that. So IT definitely diversification, halal market and food processing as um, you know, Asan has mentioned, we must also enter the halal market. Pakistan is in the halal market. If you go to Tesco Sainsbury, you'll see Pakistani Shazan brand but we're not there, but I really hope that Pran would be taking that up. Um, and um, the other sector is, you know, um, uh, the non-traditional sectors amongst the non-traditional sectors. One is I just, uh, light engineering is extremely important. You know, if you, if you, you know, India is supplying all the manhole covers in the UK, why can't we supply the lamppost? This is my point. Light engineering is something that we should definitely look into. Um, regarding Commonwealth, um, um, I wanted to mention that, you know, uh, in the Commonwealth, last year, Bangladesh took the initiative and we 
we're um, uh, elected as the B2B connectivity focal point. And coming November, we will be hosting the B2B connectivity uh, that is chamber to chamber. So I'll, I'll, I'll be writing to FBCCI president to write to all the Commonwealth uh, Apex Chambers to create this B2B connectivity platform to create a digital marketplace. So the High Commission is also working with Commonwealth Enterprise and um, Investment Council uh, in creating a, a digital marketplace for our RMG and beyond. And for that, you know, uh, the uh, we have already connected BGMEA with with the Commonwealth with the, with this digital marketplace. Um, we have worked very closely with BGMEA to um, you know not only recover. Uh, and to communicate with the retailers. But at this point, what we see, we are trying to create this digital marketplace because uh, at this point, e-commerce is the third largest business in the IT sector in the UK. So last year they had a 600 billion sales and uh, all the unicorns do 80% of their business to e-commerce. Why can't we connect to that e-commerce? So high from the High Commission, we are trying to facilitate that, that we must do everything because you know, this. In a post-COVID situation, there are uncertainties as to what's going to happen, how we're going to um, actually, you know, people are not, I mean, everything is open, the lockdown is open, but, you know, UK uh, economy has actually officially entered the recession. Uh, they had a 20% drop in their GDP and people aren't going to the, uh, uh, going to the um, retail shops. So in that context, you know, e-commerce will become extremely important, creating digital platforms. The High Commission is working on that. Um, in, in terms of investment, I think the you know the BGB group, the British um, uh, group of businesses there, who are already investors and kind of ambassadors and spokesperson for how good Bangladesh is in, in ease of doing business, etc. Um, I think they have certain uh, problems, and you've mentioned taxation. They've also come to me with the same problem. Uh, you mentioned discriminatory practices, whether in the SEZ. I think government needs to look into that because. Uh, they're the ones who are invested in Bangladesh long term uh, in terms of multinationals. And in fact, you know, the 200 and 300 million increase in FDI that you see are actually reinvestment of their profits. So, you know, how much is coming in as fresh investment and how much is reinvestment? We need to look into that. But I believe at least 60 percent of it is reinvestment by the MNCs. And for that, we really need to look into the problems, the two problems that were mentioned. Um, Apart from some of the recommendations, you know, I, I mentioned that you know there needs to be FBCCI and British Chamber connectivity. DCCI could be connecting to London Chamber, but if you do not connect, they would not know about Bangladesh. Um, and the BBG Group should have an extended, uh, uh, you know, involvement with BIDA and the uh, chambers. So we must not overlook the BBG Group regarding the FTA. Um, as you know, that we are currently um, there's only. So I just mentioned that, you know, regarding the strategic importance of Bangladesh to UK. So we started why with the US, we had um, partnership dialogue since 2009 with the with the UK. Um, fortunately, we started in quite late, but at least from 2007, it has started. Uh, the fourth is due in London. But under that umbrella, we really need to enhance uh, the trade dialogue. So there is no forum for discussing trade and investment at the current current moment. The only forum is the strategic dialogue, which is a one day or a half day dialogue. It's not necessary and the private sector is not included there. So, you know, we need to have a trade investment dialogue involving the chambers and the private sector. And there we can initiate the first seeds or latest, you know, so the first seeds of the FTA. Now, the question is, Yes, um, additional secretary from uh, Ministry of uh, Commerce has mentioned that, do we need to do an FDA? This is true that, you know, I also support one uh, uh, narrative that UK's investment into Bangladesh should not be 100% commercial because we don't have a 100% commercial relationship with, with, with the UK. It should be investing in a country where dividends and development dividends are paid back. It's a country uh, which uh, UK um, uh, should be looking into uh, you know, currently the ODA from the UK is only 200 million. Our bilateral trade is 5 billion. Our FDI is 2.4. I mean, talking about the FDI stock. In that narrative, only 200 billion is the uh, bilateral trade and that too, it mostly goes to the NGOs. So in that context, um, what I'm saying is that UK's, um, you know, interest in Bangladesh should go beyond commercial and the uh, LDC GSP should definitely go beyond 2027 because we've had post COVID and you know, post uh, Ampan. Uh, we should try to uh, uh, you know, sustain that GSP beyond our graduation as much as possible as a grace period. In the meantime, of course, we have to look into GSP plus kind of a, 
uh, FTA with, with the UK. And um, uh, uh, that dialogue, whether, you know, 2020 uh, is the year to start it, Ministry of Commerce knows better, but I think that to start the dialogue, we should study the FTA that UK has signed post-Brexit with India and Indonesia and a few other countries. Um, and uh, those agreements need to be studied and we should look into it that uh, why has India signed an FTA with uh, UK and what are the advantages. Uh, the other thing in terms of investment um, FDI, and uh, that'll be my last comment, uh, that the professors mentioned that, you know, we have so little FDI uh, compared to other Asian countries. That is a shocker. But the thing is that we value that FDI. We value four billion of FDI stock. But that FDI stock has actually come from much, I think about four decades ago. I think it's mostly the BGB group we are talking about. Because, um, you know, and it comes to power plants and, you know, services sector, building airports, infrastructure. I have sent these proposals, but I've seen that there's not much appetite because there are other Asian countries competing in this sector, so like China and other countries. So whether, you know, in the services sector, we want the British companies to come in is a policy decision that the government has to take. So I, as the high commissioner, would encourage it continuously. Last year, I've sent many proposals, but um, uh, there has to be an appetite from the government side as well, whether services sector, um, inter just not financial and fintech, beyond that, you know, infrastructure, maintenance. If you have British companies doing services in any sector, it's a branding for Bangladesh. And I believe that, you know, we should uh, not ignore, we should not overlook it. Uh, so with these words, I would like to um, uh, say that, you know, our honorable state minister is here, but from the high commission, we have facilitated many things last year. We had organized the Bangla bond along with that, with Vida, we organized a seminar, uh, you know, investment conference where the private sector advisor was also there and our finance minister was also there. Uh, but one thing is that um, we were supposed to do the Bangladesh trade and investment expo this year due to COVID, we could not. But in November, when the B2B connectivity Commonwealth event happens, we would like DCCA and other chambers to participate in that. We'll be writing to all of you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, this year is the birth centenary year of uh, our father of the nation, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And to celebrate that, uh, Dhaka Chamber had taken an initiative to do a roadshow, investment roadshow in London. And the support and help that was uh, you know, extended to Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry by Her Excellency. Uh, I would, uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, we could not make it happen, but we still want, uh, we have kept it, uh, uh, you know, if, if uh, the times permit, like if the situation gets under control, we will uh, like to um, um, do the program again in London. And uh, when we were in London, we had talks with Her Excellency and we uh, 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 were told that, to connect with the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, which we did. Uh, uh, we met the president, uh, the, the, the chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council when he was in Dhaka. And Dhaka Chamber, uh, we, we will be soon be becoming members, uh, their members. Uh, we have started discussions. So uh, with the direction and the guidance given by your excellency, uh, we are working on that. And. Uh, and with you there, Excellency, uh, we are sure you uh, we view you as a friend of the private sector of Bangladesh and a uh, uh, spokesperson of the private sector of Bangladesh to the UK. And uh, we are very hopeful that very soon under your leadership in the UK, on behalf of the business community from Bangladesh, we will break glass ceilings and we can reach new milestones in our relationship between Thank Bangladesh you very much. I just want to add one thing, you know, uh, when I was ambassador in Thailand, I always used to set a target as to how much percentage exports should increase and FDI should increase. I'm doing the same pillars of financial relationship. Uh, what is trade, number two is investment, number three is remittance. And you know, uh, last year we uh, really set a target of 5%. Uh, we've had 17% negative growth in the bilateral, you know, uh, export uh, just in the uh, last, uh, uh, financial year because of the COVID pandemic. But you know, the upcoming 2021 is going to be very crucial until 2022. Picking up on the RNG sector and if new products can enter is crucially important. But um, we believe that there's going to be a downs downsizing of the exports. You can talk to the RNG sector and you know very well. So, but the high 
from the High Commission, we are very, very connected with the BGME and the trade and the, and the retailers, and we will push it through. So um, all kinds of support from the High Commission. We're always there for you. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you once again. Uh, at this moment, I would like uh, to welcome uh, today's chief guest, uh, Mr. Mohammad Sherir Alam MP, Honorable State Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Government of Bangladesh. Sir, thank you once again for joining uh, joining to this program. And we know that uh, economic diplomacy is the is at the heart of the present government's uh, policy. Uh, so, sir, uh, the floor is yours. We would like to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I've been listening to all of your. Uh, ideas and uh, deliberations uh, for last uh, little over two hours now. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on which time zones you are in uh, in this difficult time. Uh, I must thank uh, DCCI uh, for taking this fantastic initiative. And it's a very timely one. Uh, as uh, both of us, uh, Bangladesh and UK, are battling uh, COVID-19 post-pandemic uh, economic challenges and a great deal uh, with great deal of uncertainties. Uh, uh, and I'm happy to be a part of uh, uh, this initiative uh, launched by uh, DCCI. Uh, very quickly, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm sure uh, you'll not have uh, much appetite left uh, after two, uh, two hours to uh, go back uh, 400 or 500 uh, centuries. Uh, but uh, it, it was actually the uh, Mughal Emperor Jahangir uh, who invited and allowed East India Company uh, to trade uh, uh, in 1634 and duty-free access was granted uh, uh, to them in 1717. Uh, the, the, I'll quickly explain you know, why I'm, I'm going back to this uh, history. Uh, and this Dhakai Muslim, uh, just before COVID spreaded uh, across Europe, uh, I was visiting, I think that was in Spain, uh, where I attended the last uh, ASEAN uh, Asia Europe meeting. It's called ASEM meeting, where we were taken to a museum. And I came across uh, uh, a portrait, a princess wearing a, a, a cloth made, in, uh, made with uh, muslin uh, fabric. And that must have gone to them uh, through England. Uh, uh, you know, in one of the ports, uh, because uh, you know, when Dhakai Muslim was famous, uh, UK was uh, the single destination uh, and uh, from England, uh, it was distributed uh, throughout uh, Europe. Uh, the, the, the third quick one, uh, historical one, uh, uh, that uh, I was uh, supplied with this information, fantastic information that uh, uh, during the Battle of uh, Trafalgar in 1805, uh, quite a few battleships uh, that were used by Royal Navy then uh, was actually manufactured in Chittagong. And out of the total capacity of 23,000 tons of uh, shipbuilding capacity of the UK, uh, uh, you know, much uh, of those were actually made uh, uh, in Chittagong. And that was the, the number uh, that we supplied or manufactured uh, for UK was much higher than uh, the other colonies that they used to uh, run or operate or own. So, you know, we do have uh, a very historical uh, connections uh, between these two countries. Uh, and uh, it's obviously, uh, uh, it's political and it's economical as well. Uh, and uh, as High Commissioner rightly mentioned, uh, that uh, uh, we expect uh, UK uh, to treat uh, Bangladesh and look into things differently. Uh, immediately after the partition in 1947, the two new countries that emerged, uh, Pakistan and India, uh, they were directly benefited in different front. But because we came into being 24 years after that, uh, obviously, uh, we uh, highly appreciate the contribution that UK made, uh, the people of UK made during the War of Liberation. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, Father of the Nation, Bangamudu Sheikh Majib Rahman, immediately after the release uh, from Pakistani prison, uh, decided uh, to make a 
stopover uh, in London. And uh, he met uh, the then uh, conservative prime minister of, uh, of UK, Sir Edward Heath. Uh, and uh, our relationship uh, is, is so deep that, uh, that uh, started you know, 400 years back and uh, during the very birth of Bangladesh, uh, UK played and Europe, uh, UK being the first country to recognize uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, among the any European countries. Now, coming back to uh, today's uh, discussion uh, is uh, obviously a lot of numbers. Uh, I, I, I thank uh, Dr. Salim uh, for presenting the keynote uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and obviously that tells us there are a lot to be done. Uh, diversification, uh, uh, debate or possible debate about uh, uh, FTA as absolutely no doubt uh, uh, being a businessman myself in my past life and uh, did a bit of study in uh, business management, uh, you know, uh, free trade is, is key uh, for emerging economies. You know, Vietnam is a fantastic example of uh, FTA. Uh, Turkey is a brilliant example, another brilliant example. This two country holds highest number of FTA if you compare with any other economies. Uh, but we are yet to uh, start uh, uh, or do our first one. But obviously with the UK uh, and we have commitment, uh, uh, they have left uh, EU uh, all right, uh, but uh, we have commitment uh, uh, from them that uh, duty free and quota free access will continue. Uh, but the new tax, uh, um, or, or, or tariff regime that will start in the new year uh, from January. Uh, obviously, uh, we are uh, constructively engaged. Our uh, high commissions, uh, both the high commissions, and uh, you know, that's very much in the agenda. And uh, I am actually uh, scheduled to have a meeting with my counterpart uh, uh, in little over uh off uh, in, in about 30 40 minutes so we need to finish it off here quickly but uh, uh, uh while i appreciate uh, at the same time uh, i see uh, that uh, there's a bit of a confusion uh, about whether or not uh, we should go or attempt fta uh, with uk uh, i don't personally don't think and there are enough logic and uh, i think similar voices uh, other participants uh, raised is that uh, you know we we do have a duty free access uh, and uh, we are tremendously benefited and even policymakers in the uk would go on to appreciate that bangladesh actually utilized uh, eba uh, arrangements uh, with eu uh, and even uh, minus uh, uk now but uh, uh, with uk bilaterally uh, better use that facilities and uh, you know all the progresses that you see we made in social front women empowerment uh, you know general empl employment improved in education uh, the the economic growth of uh, over eight uh, percent last year and and all that uh, you know is is uh, obviously uh, a, a credit goes to that uh, single largest uh, uh, arrangement that we had with, uh, or we are still having with the EU, uh, contributed greatly. Uh, last year, obviously, our growth rate was about 8.13%, uh, if I can recall correctly. But we are all hit hard by uh, this COVID. And uh, uh, after uh, uh, January, uh, March this year, uh, Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina uh, came up uh, with possibly the largest uh, uh, plan uh, to, to fight the COVID impact. And that's about 4% uh, of our GDP, $12 billion, uh, you know, largest uh, in South Asia and second largest in Asia. Uh, and uh, the very brave and very well uh, thought out decision to try and open up the economy uh, as early as I can't recall the exact date, but uh, uh, you know, sometime in April uh, or May, when we decided to open up partially uh, the export-oriented uh, industries, 
uh, started paying dividend already. Uh, the nervousness, uh, the concerns uh, among businesses, both from supplying and receiving end, um, and people who whose job is to play with the number or keep an eye rather on a serious note with the on, with the on the numbers. Uh, we are happy to see that uh, our export, uh, I wouldn't say, is completely back on track, but uh, obviously we are in the right track at least. And uh, then. Uh, you know, more good news uh, coming. Uh, IMF, uh, Standard Chartered, HSBC uh, came up with uh, different analysis. Uh, World Economic Outlook suggests uh, it, this is IMF number that Bangladesh uh, could grow uh, as high as nine and a half percent GDP growth next year. Uh, you know, obviously, assuming that COVID is going to go away and life will uh, be normal as before. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we are in our budget, uh, we actually downplayed that. Uh, we, estimate that uh, we estimate that we will grow at the rate of 8.2%. Uh, but uh, obviously, it will be fantastic if IMF forecast uh, comes out true. And uh, it's not just we are leaving things uh, into someone else's hand. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's leadership. Uh, uh, last 10 years uh, tells us very clearly that you know uh, she never shies away from making uh, brave decisions tough decisions decisions uh, that are timely uh, and that's why uh, she uh, came up with that 12 billion dollar uh, rescue package if i may say so uh, so but uh, obviously that's for bangladesh in general but on a bilateral context uh, UK and Bangladesh needs to achieve uh, a, a lot of uh, potentials, uh, always there and are there. And uh, it's, it's not just uh, uh, from yesterday. You know, on a personal note, when I, I started my business about 28 years ago, uh, I started off working for a British company very briefly. Then I went on to set up a joint venture. And I'm talking about the days when uh, a truck used to take uh, 12, 14 hours to reach Chittagong. There are congestions in Chittagong port. Uh, there are very frequent power shortages. But yet, British businesses came to invest to Bangladesh and they found uh, that it's profitable for them. Uh, and uh, more and more uh, companies are coming, but obviously uh, we need to diversify. Uh, we need to uh, uh, you know, work with uh, IT companies, uh, the industry for related activities uh, to facilitate that. We from Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, recently uh, signed, uh, I say recently, but you know, I myself visited during my last visit with, uh, with Cambridge uh, and we have appointed uh, uh, the professors as consultants uh, to help us uh, uh, in these regards. Uh, and obviously there will be particular uh, projects, uh, trials with private businesses, and we'll, we'll, we'll surely uh, can uh, consider uh, uh, the DCCI as, as a partner. Uh, our High Commission is doing a fantastic job, and high, as a High Commissioner mentioned, that uh, obviously we measure their performances uh, based on uh, these numbers, uh, you know, how much growth that has taken place, but obviously uh, things are, are, are much more challenging uh, now, uh, uh, different speakers came up uh, with, uh, with different suggestions, uh, especially, you know, how to trade the, during this post-COVID uh, era. What should be the marketing strategy? What are the new products? And, uh, you know, we, we have heard about the bicycle, pharmaceuticals, vaccine, um, uh, digital uh, IT or, uh, you know, IT-enabled services, uh, digitally trading uh, platform. Uh, so we are uh, working closely, uh, but I have a, a very specific, uh, I'll not go on and, you know, talk just uh, this general, uh, you know, and try and encourage you, uh, all of you are self-motivated individuals, uh, some of you are self-made, uh, many of you are second generation businesses, uh, you know, running an operation uh, of a, a very solid foundation. Uh, I'll go on and... Uh, I recommend a few things that I think we should be doing. Um, and 
uh, this would be my, uh, you know, concluding part of my uh, statement uh, that uh, uh, what should we be doing? Uh, firstly, I think we should, uh, Bangladesh and UK, uh, need, we need to intensify and broaden uh, the trade and investment agenda in our uh, ongoing strategic, uh, you know, dialogue, the framework that we have, which I personally believe should be upgraded to a you know, we should elevate that to a partnership dialogue uh, for this purpose. Uh, second, you know, with the UK's uh, uh, exit transition from the EU by the end of uh, this year, which is, you know, a, this year is, you know, almost lost. So, you know, to, uh, it, we, we all feel funny about, you know, talking about 2020. And when I say end of this year, I suddenly realize that we only have about three and a half months left of this year. Uh, and subsequent exit from the EU, uh, you know, Bangladesh Joint Commission, uh, we should consider creation of a BD-UK uh, Joint Commission because they are no longer part of EU uh, or a dedicated uh, you know, one-day joint trade and investment dialogue uh, under the framework uh, of the proposed partnership uh, dialogue participation of chambers and private sectors from uh, both countries. Uh, this is very essential uh, for these dialogues, which could discuss the entire gamut of uh, trade and investment opportunities and challenges in the post Brexit. So I'm uh, you know, suggesting that we should have, you know, one day long yearly dialogue, uh, purely to talk about trade and investment. Uh, third, uh, business to business and Apex Chamber connectivity, as High Commissioner mentioned, uh, we, we must establish this uh, between these two countries and is to further strengthen uh, whatever mechanism that we have. If any chamber, let's say BCCI or BGMEA, uh, is probably already engaged with someone, but we need to strengthen those and we need to have new relationship. Uh, the role of ABCCI, uh, uh, British Bangladesh uh, Business Group, uh, BBG and DCCI to connect with the British Chamber and regular exchange uh, uh, of trade and investment uh, delegations uh, with targets uh, for possible B2B business meetings uh, is crucial. Uh, fourth, I would uh, suggest that uh, we must uh, uh, devise uh, post-COVID new marketing strategies and digital marketplaces for promoting and branding a new and traditional Bangladeshi products in the UK, including RMG. And uh, uh, Shams uh, uh, Mahmoud mentioned that uh, they were planning to do something, but obviously uh, they had to postpone it. But uh, as businesses are opening up again, I'm sure uh, they will consider uh, still consider doing that and our high commission will always be ready to, to support. Uh, uh, fifth, uh, uh, well, I, I thank the British government uh, for their uh, post-Brexit announcements that we have received already that uh, on sustaining Bangladesh duty-free uh, access to the UK market in the post-Brexit. It would be crucial for uh, uh, Bangladesh's post-pandemic and uh, uh, you know, post Amphan, and we are fighting a flood as we speak uh, as well, uh, uh, and trying to recover uh, the rural economy from those damages uh, caused by these natural calamities. Uh, and also the SDGs recovery, as well as uh, uh, eventual LDG graduation uh, for the UK to sustain its uh, GSP uh, preferential treatment, uh, much beyond uh, the graduation of 2024 or uh, and extend it until uh, 2030 to match the SDG uh, uh, timeline uh, for a smooth transition. And uh, sixth, uh, and uh, the, the last one that uh, connecting our diaspora, obviously we have almost 700,000 Bangladeshis uh, uh, and you know, someone said that that sitting uh, or you know, they have uh, reasonably good wealth and sometimes uh, they are confused. I have met many uh, of these uh, individuals uh, uh, and uh, we have engaged with, uh, at least I can, I don't want to name it, uh, two particular uh, regional chamber in the UK uh, run by uh, uh, you know, British Bangladeshis uh, and uh, trying to give them the right direction. And uh, we are in constant touch with them, uh, but uh, the youth, uh, I attended a couple of years ago, uh, uh, a British uh, Bangladesh Business Award, I think uh, it was. And, uh, you know, till I uh, went there, I think that was about four years ago, 
uh, you know, uh, my impression about uh, British Bangladesh is where that, you know, most of them are, all of them are involved in car industry. But I met these uh, fantastic uh, over thousand very young, bright British Bangladeshis who are uh, not just in curry business, or I, I actually haven't met anyone of that age group uh, in curry industry, but rather in service sectors, in hospitality, in uh, in IT, in in fintech, in uh, in uh, in other areas, uh, and uh, I, I was very happy to see their activities. And uh, uh, but uh, they have somewhat lost the connection with the roots. So here, my last suggestion would be that uh, connecting our diaspora especially British Bangladeshi youth who are, who are now in the driving seat uh, of British Bangladeshi economic activities with Bangladeshi youth entrepreneurs. Uh, the startups who are looking for some funding, some handholding, some help uh, could be fruitful uh, for channeling skill, expertise, uh, and resources of new generation in trade and businesses between two countries. I always find great enthusiasm, as I said, among British Bangladeshis to join up in philanthropic activities in Bangladesh. Uh, we need to I think how these philanthropic activities uh, could be more productively exploited for businesses and social investment projects. Uh, I don't obviously want to bring, uh, but uh, it's not just politics, it's beyond that also uh, that uh, we, we see often uh, that funds are being raised by Bangladeshi diaspora. Uh, you know, these are mosque-based initiative. Uh, I, I'm not saying that they are, they are all uh, with, uh, with uh, different agendas to say the least, but you know there are examples and evidences in place that uh, those funds were uh, misused rather and went on to fund something uh, which uh, we all should try and stop. But anyways, uh, so you know that's also available uh, and we need to guide them better together. And uh, here at the DCCI, uh, I call upon the young and energetic leadership uh, to connect to London Chamber and to organize events, uh, as mentioned already, uh, that would attract uh, mainstream and relevant British uh, uh, businesses to take uh, a confident look at uh, Bangladesh, to put uh, in their uh, money in a country that would never uh, let them down. Uh, I thank all of you uh, for, uh, for patient uh, hearing. Uh, and again, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate and thank DCCI for organizing uh, such a timely and a very efficiently uh, managed uh, webinar. Shabai bhalo thakben, shusto thakben. God bless you. Uh, thank you very much. Jai Bangla, Jai Bangla. Thank you so much, uh, uh, today's chief guest, Sherry uh, Alam uh, MP, Honorable State Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Government of Bangladesh. Um, sir, thank you so much. Uh, we also know that uh, you are also a friend of the private sector. The private sector views you, uh, especially as a very close friend of the private sector, and you're always taking decisions, and you're always trying to engage with the private sector to see different avenues, how we can take it further. So once again, sir, thank you so much. And with this, I would like to request Mr. N.K. Mobin, FCA, Senior Vice President, DCCI, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, President. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good morning and good afternoon, depending on the various time zones. Uh, on behalf of Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I would like to take the privilege to extend my special thanks to respected guests for your kind presence and participation. My special thanks and gratitude goes to the Chief Guest, His Excellency, Mr. M.D. Sharia Alom, MP, Honorable State Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Government of Bangladesh. It is also my great pleasure to have the opportunity to extend my heartfelt thanks to His Excellency, Mr. Robert Chatterton Dixon, Honorable British High Commissioner to Bangladesh, and Her Ex Excellency, Ms. Saida Muna Tasneem, Honorable High Commissioner of Bangladesh, to the United Kingdom for their kind participation and valuable insights. I'd like to thank the keynote speaker, Dr. Selim Rahan, Executive Director Sanem, and distinguished panelists who have enlightened us with their valued observation and thoughtful recommendations. 
distinguished guest meanwhile discussions have illustrated the potentials of business and investment opportunities between bangladesh and the uk the historical relationships between the two countries can be enhanced further through facilitating economic cooperation between the private sector and signing preferential trade agreements the discussions have also underscored bangladesh as the promising investment destination and uk investors can invest in bangladesh wide ranging manufacturing sector and service industry collaboration between the private sector of both countries needs to be strengthened to tap the emerging economic opportunities we will send the recommendations emerged from this webinar to the concerned government agencies of bangladesh to address the burning issues i hope government will consider our recommendations to explore growing trade and investment potentials between the two countries and help boost bilateral economic relations distinguished guest once again i express my deep gratitude to all the distinguished participants for being with us and make this webinar successful one thank you very much thank you uh with the permission of the chair uh, sir once again thank you uh, uh so we would like to conclude today's webinar and uh, once again on behalf of dcci thank you to all the panelists the special guests the chief guest and uh, the, especially the keynote presenter uh, hopefully uh, we will see you in the future uh, we will try to arrange uh, webinars like this uh, to address the burning issues uh, in the coming days thank you thank you so much thank you thank, thank you, you sir